right, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Let's fucking do this. Bone Club Season 4. Here comes to... Start to kick it. It I gotta, I gotta work on my major Kong impression for next time and really let those cowboy <laughs> yells fucking go. Uh, hello, happy Easter, everyone! Or uh, if you celebrate the Sumerian version of the holiday, I think it's uh, Estara. I don't know. There's some old Sumerian Babylonian spring thing. It's just uh, very convenient that Christ was crucified on the fucking same day. Anyway, uh, welcome. <laughs> this is season four of the Bone Club Resurrected. Uh, perfect evening for it here. We got Evan, we got Rubs, and hopefully Fudge Holden himself will uh, be joining us later in the evening. Uh, if you guys are here uh, on the stream accidentally, or you subscribe to my page because you like the music and guitar playing, uh, I'm gonna have to warn you that this sort of <laughs> this sort of schizophrenia is contagious. Uh, so if you don't like the idea of hidden messages in movies, uh, you're gonna want to slowly back out of the room this evening uh, and join us again some other time. Uh, but for those of you, I think I know why you're here. Ever since I started this page, uh, I've always posted a lot of stuff, but the the most popular stuff was always Mr. Kubrick. He's got the built-in fan base. That's why I named the page after him. Um, so tonight we have a lovely PowerPoint presentation uh, put together by yours truly, your humble narrator. Uh, we are discussing my favorite uh, set piece from The Shining, the Colorado Lounge, uh, and everything that will sort of connect uh, with the Colorado Lounge. We're going to be talking JFK, we're going to be talking central banks, we're going to be talking insurance fraud, uh, what else, assassinations, mind control, uh, film as a language, uh, and all sorts of stuff. It's going to be 
it's going to be fucking phenomenal. I don't want to toot my own horn before we even start. Um, but just another warning, this is not your, uh, your older brother's room 237 boomer, boomer stuff. This is, uh, yeah, yeah as far as, as, as Kubrick stuff this goes. This is real shit. This is some, yeah, this is some real, real shit. shit. It's not like, uh, I always thought room 237 was, was doing a disservice, uh, to anyone that was looking into the language of film and in particular, uh, the language of Kubrick films, um, and that. They knew there that there's something in here, so shit. What do we do? Let's make this documentary about how there's nothing in here and everybody's crazy and the 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 obsession uh, aspect of the documentary. Uh, so we're gonna try to go out of our way tonight uh, to go above and beyond any sort of Jay Widener uh, sort of uh, regular Stanley Kubrick stuff. Uh, I'm gonna try to take it to the next level for everyone. Um, so I think that's all the public service announcements I have. Uh, Evan, welcome. Rubs, welcome. Um, oh, I do have one more. <laughs> one more, and then I promise we can start. Uh, so everyone knows to, like, what's the phrase? Hide their power level, right? It's easy to, to hide your power level when you're talking about, uh, I don't know, war or finance or politics or something. Yeah. But I fucking forgot you have to hide your power level at Easter, too. <laughs> now, you may say, what are you talking about, Lab Stan? Well, there's this thing where Easter is about how uh, Christ was, he was dead for three days and then he rose, you know. And there's also this really interesting thing with, with the sun, the S-U-N, that it dies for three days and, and then it starts to rise again. It just happens, you know, in December. Uh, and I accidentally let, let my knowledge of that slip in front of some people at work and they looked at me like, what the fuck did you just say to me? <laughs> so <laughs> that's just the... Uh, don't forget to hide your power level not on not only on holocaust remembrance day but you're going to want to hide that power level on things like <laughs> easter too <laughs> oh man so evan what i want to do tonight first is i want to set the stage right so if anyone stumbles upon this they can they can sort of unfold the journey with us you know we don't just want to yeah. jump right into the deep end of the pool i'm going to want to uh, pre precoitus <laughs> so um, do you, do you rubs and you, uh, Evan have your zoom screen shares going this evening? Yeah. Right. Yes. These are going to be, these are going to be key because I spent 9,000 hours in MS paint putting this together for you guys. And I just want you to be able to follow along with me. Uh, everybody at home on the YouTube will be following along. Of course, that all seems to be working just fine. Uh, so I wanted to start Evan with this quote from Mr. Mustache himself. Um, and the quote is, and those who were seen dancing were thought to be insane by those who could not hear the music. You ever heard that quote before? I've never heard it, but I get it. I know it's exactly a fucking, what it is. It's great. Yeah. This guy and his aphorisms, man, he has, he has another aphorism that's like, I want to say in 10 words what somebody says in a whole book. So I kind of like, mm -hmm. like this stuff. Um, so I always liked this because I have a lot of what are the personal examples from my own life, right? Because I consider myself one of the people that can hear the music, right? <laughs> and is dancing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people are like, what? But I've also been on the other side of this where when I was traveling in Russia, you may know this stereotype that it, Russians talking to each other, it always sounds like they're yelling at each other. Mm. But they're not. <laughs> it's just how they talk, right? <laughs> so in that situation, I was the insane person who couldn't hear the music because I don't understand the language and the culture. You know? Yep. So I was always a little bit out of the loop there. And I feel that when it comes to Kubrick and movies and, and other types of symbolism, if you if you don't hear the music, it's all just complete nonsense, right? Yeah, some people don't speak like the language of cinema, and it takes a little while to sort of get it. Yeah, and cinema's an example of where we're going tonight, but I have another example. Are you familiar with these sort of Manly P. Hall, Rosicrucian, alchemical drawings? Not super familiar. Like, they have these sort of, you know, it'll have a hand with a fish in the middle and some oh, okay, symbols yeah. on the fingers. And there's all of these symbols within these drawings that if you don't right. if you don't know what a green lion eating the sun is, this thing is nonsense, right? This whole picture. But if you know, mm. if you know the history of the, the pictures, you can put images like this together. And, right. and it's not complete gibberish, but I don't know anything about astrology and how Saturn is connected to my ring finger and shit. So this stuff is a little bit um, <laughs> out of my league, but it, it's another good example of if you know the history of, of a thing or a symbol or a picture, 
you can sort of put it all together um, and it can be hidden, you know, um, somewhat right. one person can look at an alchemical drawing like me and be like, okay, super. That guy has a little fish in his hand, but you know, someone <laughs> a little more learned could be like, um, oh, that represents the age of Pisces and you know, all of these mm. sort of things. Um, so to take this over to something like Stanley Kubrick and the shining, right? It's just yeah. like, just like these alchemical drawings are made up of a bunch of symbols that existed before this drawing was put together. The shining is made up of things that existed before the shining was put together. Mm -hmm. So a lot of, you know, if there's anyone out there that really loves Kubrick, just plug your ears for a second. Uh, Kubrick was a hack when it came to The Shining. <laughs> he, he stole everything in this movie. Every scene, all the soundtracks, all the names, uh, everything is from another movie. It's a, a mashup. It's a, everything is a remix. Um, and we're just going to kind of go through some of these because just like you would need to know what the fish means in the palm of a hand in an alchemical drawing, well, what the fuck does it mean when when the guy says all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, you know where is that from? Uh, what's the word when you study uh, where language comes from, Evans? You know off the top of your head, it's like uh, philology. Is that the right word? Someone help me out in the chat. I got smart fans. Yeah. I think it's philology. So yeah. the word kindergarten, you know, you know it's from German, and it tells you a little bit about what kindergarten is, and it has all that information encoded in the word itself. Uh, so here's just some, and of course, I, if we had to do every example of The Shining, would be here all fucking night. But here's just a little yep. bit of how Stanley Kubrick stole the entire fucking idea for this from other movies. Okay, so uh, one reference, you've got the bridge on the River Quay. And again, some of these we're going to dive into a lot more later in the show. Uh, but all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Boom, that's stolen from uh, Bridge on the River Quay. Um, Dick Halloran's name is stolen from this covered wagon movie. Uh, Jack breaking down the door is stolen from the phantom carriage. Entire dolly movements and camera movements are stolen from Hal Ashby's being there. Uh, you've got sort of the Wendy attack scene is in Broken Blossoms. Wendy walking up the stairs is in fucking Nosferatu. Uh, of course, Evan, Night to Remember. I, I got it in here. Yeah. Um, all the scenes yeah. from the ballroom and shit are from Night to Remember. Jack throwing the shit on the floor. Uh, the backwards R, drawn like a kid. Um, you know, that's from Flowers from Algernon, you know. <laughs> that's everything. Now, John Smith in the chat is saying stolen versus homage. And I'm definitely getting yeah. to that. John Smith is smart, so he's jumping ahead real quick. And it's, it's not that Kubrick is stealing this stuff because he has no ideas. There's a reason he's using this language, just like there's a reason the alchemical <laughs> drawings put the fish in the palm of the hand. It's just that you wouldn't know it at first. Um, some other ones here, Summer of 42 is just straight up playing in The Shining, uh, but there's tons of thematic stuff going on here. Uh, this Italian movie here, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it, uh, the, the scene where Dick Halloran is sitting under his painting of the, the naked woman, you know, that slow zoom out on Dick Halloran, uh, that's lifted yep. from this movie. Uh, you've got Danny walking through the hotel, just like Igmar Bergman's movie here. Uh, that's also the tricycle and the omen. And then it just goes on and on. The, the best one though, is, uh, this movie, the car, it starts with the exact same music as the beginning of the shining same fucking Damn. song at the same point in the movie um so it's it's endless and this is just a fucking one collage right so yep so if you just watch the shining and you hadn't seen any of these movies you would miss out right on the encoded information just like you would miss out you know why is the key on the pinky finger in the rosicrucian old drawings you know so this this brings me to stolen versus homage homage if you will yeah i think that all of this stuff is chosen on purpose not not even as a homage but because it's supposed to lead you to the themes and information in these other movies to fill out the narrative that is lacking in the shining yeah and it's it, I think the the quote is it's not, not where you take it from it's where you take it to like he's Ooh, like he's that. adding to it. Oh absolutely yeah. it's 
it's creating a web of associations and contextualizations or you know it's it's padding out it's things that aren't completely obvious in the shining become completely obvious when you've seen the source material and that sort of thing um mm -hmm. and again it's in some ways it's it's a dig at kubrick but once i think you see that this is the only way to encode loads and loads of information into a picture that it's like it becomes less nefarious yep. i guess because of um the the information that's encoded into it like if he just encoded the recipe for chicken soup into his movies it wouldn't be as interesting right but he's encoded the generations long a new illuminati conspiracy to enslave mankind into his movie that's the thing yes that's the information that he's trying to you know do it um quai is pronounced Qu quay oh so it's the bridge over the river i got somebody in the chat the zappa figures yeah. a frank zappa fan correcting my pronunciation anyway we're going to get to this movie <laughs> because this movie and it's a book too um the bridge over the river qui am i saying it right zappa the bridge over the river qui anyway this is what happens when you only read words and don't say them out loud um, it's about uh it's a movie about uh pow's that are forced to build a bridge uh for japan and we're going to tie that to Kubrick being forced to give up his um, whatever film secrets that him and Douglas Trumbull got. He's for, that's the bridge he has to build for the moon landing. Anyway, we're yeah. going to get to that. We're jumping ahead. Oh, Fudge is in the house. Good evening, Fudge Holden. Good evening. Yes, hello. Uh, right now we're just setting the stage. I'm trying to save us from the uh, the inevitable commenter that's like, you guys are a bunch of room two, three, seven schizos, <laughs> you know. <laughs> We're just schizos. Well, did you did you did you catch my analogy to the alchemical drawings, the uh, the Rosicrucian stuff, and how they're made up of symbols that you would have to know the meanings of to really understand the image itself? I did not catch that, but I agree with it. Okay, so this image that you see on your Zoom screen here is. It's the, the DNA of The Shining, because The Shining is a, is a remix of all of these things and more. This is just what I could fucking grab. Um, yes. And th these associations go into everything from actors to things in the movie. And it's, I mean, it's really a cool way to give an attentive audience something more. Do continue. Yeah, no, I just, I just want to bring you up That's, to speed. Yeah. You know, I just Thank wanted you. to... Cool, cool. All right, Fudge is fucking here. Okay, so I think I think we're fucking ready. I think we set the stage just enough. Um, yeah, John Smith says, like Tarantino, exactly. Uh, everything is a remix. Yeah. Everything is a remix. I'll post it down bottom. It's a it's a fucking brilliant old video about uh, how Tarantino, you know, composes his movies and gets his ideas. Good stuff. You know, it's where I learned to mash up. So, um, all right. So, there's one more thing. Um, before we move into um, some crazy shit, um, yeah. Um, apparently, now I wasn't alive, so I can't can't confirm nor deny this next little thing. Um, but let me just read this. Uh, more than thirty years ago, Congress enacted the President John F. Kennedy Assassination Records Collection Act of 1992, enacted in the wake of Oliver Stone's movie JFK, which posited that the Kennedy assassination was a regime change operation on the part of the U.S. National Security Establishment. Uh, the law mandated that all the assassination-related records of the Pentagon, the CIA, the Secret Service, the FBI, and other federal agencies uh, be released to the public, having succeeded in keeping their assassinated related. So anyway, it it seemed to me that nobody was really freaking out about Kennedy until the, the Oliver Stone movie came out, and maybe comedians like Bill Hicks had their great Kennedy bits, and George Carlin had his Kennedy bits. and But it seems like something about the this movie... They were like, oh, fuck, before people start doing Freedom of Information Acts and all that, we had better lock this shit up, right? Because they obviously did it, so they need to they need to fucking put the lid on this. And when I started digging into it, I was aware of the, you know, they've been kept secret. Trump was supposed to give the Kennedy files out, but he didn't. Um, and it's just crazy to me that all it took was Oliver Stone's movie to really be like oh shit we got to do this because it makes it seem like nobody even was thinking about it you know 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I found this fucking super crazy, and that's the thing about this Kubrick thing is that I don't, I don't do this a lot anymore because if you do dig into Kubrick for two seconds, you're gonna find more shit. So it's it's fucking crazy. Uh, Zappa says I'm curious about the being there shots. If I'm not mistaken, being there was shot at the same time as The Shining, though The Shining was released after being there. Yes, this has been mm-hmm. one of my, uh, you know, the Zappa. This has been one of my most, you know confused about things is that being there in the shining have so many similarities between them yet they're shooting at the same time and uh, but there are reasons why these movies would be in communication with each other during production and without even going in too much of a conspiratorial um, thing it would be like peter sellers is you know friends with kubrick and peter sellers is working on the uh the movie being there so I feel like there could have been this sort of line of communication and Hal Ashby is famous for uh, the Steadicam and The Shining is famous for the Steadicam and there's a lot of these these things and it's always been fascinating to me and I don't have an answer, unfortunately. Uh, John Smith says, being there couldn't hold my attention. Uh, yeah, Hal Ashby is, is hit or miss as far as uh, uh, that sort of thing, um, but the pacing and the music and stuff and... Again, I think being there is Hal Ashby's uh, fuck you to whatever, the Illuminati, for, to the powers that be. Uh, so if you do ever feel it, uh, dude, you got to go back and check it out. It's, it's fucking freaky as hell. All right. So I think all the business is handled. Now, since this, this always hits close to home, the shining stuff for me, boys, and some of you know why that is. <clears throat> now, excuse me, but right in the microphone. Uh there's a lot of well-known hotels affiliated with The Shining, right? Uh, Timber, mm-hmm. The Timberlane Lodge, right, Evan? The Stanley Hotel. These are very mm-hmm. well-known Shining doppelganger, overlook doppelgangers hotels. Um, but there's one that is less known, I would say, to the general public, and that is going to be uh, the... Mount Washington Hotel, just just <laughs> just right in Lab Stan's backyard. Uh, this is the lovely Mount Washington Hotel here up in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. This is Mount Washington behind it. Uh, the Chelsea, too, another hotel. Thank you, John Smith. Um, and this is an actually incredibly famous hotel because in the World War II days, they really changed the monetary system at this hotel. Uh, there's a room called the Gold Room right here. Um, and it's where everybody got together and signed the Bretton Woods system, monetary management, blah, blah, blah. Now, I did not do good at economics in college, but I think the takeaway here is the Bretton Woods system made possible the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and then the World Bank. So it's, I don't understand how the gold and the money thing works, but this is going to go to Rob Ager's great series of... uh, the gold room, the shining thing, his documentary. Um, and it seems like gold was important to the way they manage the world in a way that it might not be today. Uh, again, something we'll look at. And then again, it's not a very big stretch, right? Because the shining has the gold room and this room in this hotel is known as the gold room because of this agreement signed in the forties. Um, yeah, John Smith is saying it took us off the gold standard to fiat. Uh, and again, it's, it's way out of my league. Um, but if, that, if that's part of it, that means that the banks can then loan more money than they usually could. Um, it's actually funny. Here is the, the ballroom at the uh, Mount Washington Hotel. This is where Lab Stan had his high school prom, absolutely drunk as shit, cranked out on Adderall in this fucking very room. <laughs> so good times. And it looks <laughs> kind of, yeah, it kind of looks like the fucking, uh, you know, the main room here in The Shining, the gold room. So it's... That's some synchronicity to that, buddy. Not only is my hairline going in the Jack Torrance direction, um, I have a very, <laughs> very close association with this uh, hotel, like I said. Uh, this is where the local high school had its fucking prom, proms, man. Go ahead, Rubs. Um, uh, did you um in in your um uh prom prom like when you got drunk? Did you did you have like did you have sex like sex <laughs> sex like drunk sex with anyone? No. Okay. 
Thanks, Rubs. Thanks for jumping in with that sure super that important stuff. I'm making, I'm making <laughs> sure there was no there was no semen. There was no ghost semen. No, no. We're gonna get to, we're gonna get to ghost semen. Don't you worry. Actually, John Smith said he was also cranked out on Adderall at his prom. See, this is us all coming together because we're all you know great minds think alike. So again, don't sleep on the Mount Washington Hotel, the Bretton Woods Agreement, and that sort of stuff because I. I don't even know if Rob Ager mentions the, this hotel in his uh, Shining Gold Story thing. He might, uh, but I'm not entirely positive. Uh, but again, this is going to be one of those things that not every average, you know, uh, Shining viewer knows about the fucking Bretton Woods Accords in, in New Hampshire. That's fucking crazy, right? Um, and I do want to add just for fun. Can I tell a story? Oh, yes. Yeah, we're just, I'm going to add something for fun, and then it's going to Evan. Yeah. Um, the locals, the local good old boys say that there's a military base under Mount Washington behind this hotel. And that, I'm just going to leave it right there. So, Evan, jump on in. What you got to add to that little thing? Oh, I was just going to say that, um, like, whatever, to just to set this whole thing off, because it's going to get a little bit crazy in a second, uh, that, like, I have this new kid working at the barn with me, and he's, like, the film guy in his group. So I've been telling him shit about movies. I've been blowing his fucking mind. He loves Scooby Doo, all that shit. He got it. <laughs> all about awesome. the witch in the lighthouse. I was blowing this kid's. Oh my god! Mind. But I just barely mentioned. I see the Zapruder film in The Shining. I saw the light in this kid's eyes go out. So this is this is some wild <laughs> shit. It's not gonna be a stretch to get to JFK in The Shining, and you know why, right. and I know why. Everybody fucking yes. knows why. So we're gonna get to JFK. <clears throat> we have to we have to slowly slowly get there because I right. think it's it's uh, so interesting. Who was that? Who wants to jump in? I just noticed something that's fucking with me. Um I've been like uh recentered on Ish Ishtar lately. Yeah. And I want to talk about the star tonight. Easter. Look at the bottom of the chandelier. The bottom of the chandelier here? Yeah, it's an eight pointed star. And that's the Ishtar mm -hmm. star. Yes, it's the Ishtar star. Which is the original Easter celebration spring goddess, right? Ishtar? Ch yeah, child, dude. child sacrifice, that sort of thing? Oh, more than that. It's, more it's... than that. <laughs> so much more. Nice. Um, uh, that's interesting because I feel like that's going to be another layer underneath. If we were archaeologists, right, the, the JFK stuff is going to be a top layer because it happened recently in history. But if Stanley Kubrick is worth his salt, there should be more layers as we go deeper and deeper into this thing. So I think the Mesoamerican and the Ishtar Sumerian stuff is totally, you know, in play for this sort of thing. I agree. I, I nice. don't think it's necessarily indicative of like a Bohemian Grove, like never ending Ishtar cult. But like, I think Ishtar is at play as it's... a symbol and perhaps a point of worship. Because it's tied so intimately with the seasons, right? That that's that's got to be super important. That the names of the gods and goddesses may change, but the the ideas will essentially stay the same. Because we kept the egg and the bunny and shit. We just got rid of some of the other stuff, you know, some of the other fertility related symbols. Interesting, man. And John Smith wants to know. Uh, he says JFK represents Jack Torrance. Yeah, man, it, and it's even crazier. Yeah, Jack. It's even crazier yeah. than that, dude. That's just the fucking top of it. Um, so, what you guys are looking at, if you've been whatever under a rock for a few decades, this is my favorite set. This is the fucking Colorado Lounge, and the reason we're gonna get to JFK at the beginning is because The Shining starts with JFK giving you a tour of the hotel for twenty minutes. Like, it's not. <laughs> yeah. it's not a fucking stretch. Um, but this is the first time we see the Colorado Lounge, and. There's always something that's hit me strangely about this. Now, I don't want to play the clip because I don't want to get this shit banned. But if you guys want to notice, this is Jack and Wendy. They're walking through, right? You guys see this this guy back here at the bookcase? Yes. Yeah. Th this guy's cleaning the bookcase, and he looks like Jack. He's wearing Jack's clothes from the yeah. thir third act. So, yes. So... I think in this, as we go along in The Shining, we're watching a movie where some things are happening in Jack's head and and some things are, hap and are happening in real life. Like, I don't think everything we see in this movie is happening. Some of it is Jack working on his book or we're in some sort of Bardo hotel between the living yeah. and, and the dead. <laughs> That's what I like. I feel strongly that the ghosts are there in the very first scenes, mm. but like 
including the guy who's running the hotel he, uh, possibly he's always been there you've always been yeah. the caretaker always been the caretaker yeah so when jack sees himself from the third act with jfk in in this opening thing this opening tour it it's really already starting to sub unconsciously or whatever you know like horsley says this thing is sucking you in like my zoom wheel here this thing is designed uh, to sort of <laughs> do this to you um so again we may be playing into stanley's fucking greater uh plan here but it's 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 going to be a lot of fun um another shot of the colorado lounge in the evening um, we're going to come back to this one because this is Evan's uh, Buffalo Head Frame 237, yeah. Dealey Plaza. But I just wanted to say that when I was young, I didn't understand all this stuff about The Shining. Like I saw it when I was a teenager. I thought it was some kind of strange horror movie and whatever. But I always thought Wendy Torrance was super cute. She's of not, course. She, yeah, she's not traditionally. I know Shelley Duvall was like a sex symbol. She dated Ringo Starr. But my, well, I just want to say that my one of my first whatever crushes that brought Lab Stan's you know testosterone to the top was Shelley Duvall in The Shining, and she's screaming, she's terrified, and it, I don't know if it's a a good memory, but go ahead, Fudge. <laughs> well, I, I had the same thing with Carrie Fisher in Return of the Jedi, so oh, like yeah, yeah. I, I connect with you there. Um, but like for me, each room in the movie is a temple, and so like it's appropriate that you have like an uncomfortably sexy priestess. You know, like that's mm. part of the dimension of it. But She's... like the way the rooms are laid out, it's so evocative of a temple. Like this, mm. th this looks like more of a house of worship than a meeting room to me. Absolutely, absolutely. And we're going to, uh, Rubs, before well, we, one second, Rubs. Well. I just want to say this is uh, this is looking semi uh, Mesoamerican, if you will. Uh, we'll get to that. Go ahead, Rubs. Uh, well, you meant you mentioned how uh, how you used to get turned on by um wendy when uh wendy or shelly duvall like screaming screaming in like the final act right the... well i was i, I thought she yeah. was cute like... during the whole movie but i was it's it's strange to to be to because she's gonna crack it's an alcoholic drink before rubs finishes go the for question. it so rubs she doesn't start freaking out until the end of the movie right rubs so up until the end yeah. she's she's super cute and you develop that bond with her before she breaks down so that makes the attack on Wendy even more difficult because you've identified her as a cutie. Okay, uh, what what I was thinking is that like you you might have like a rape, like a no, rape fetish, no. right? Like like so like when she's screaming. Um, mm, I, I don't think I'd take yeah. it that deep actually. Okay. No, no, I okay. don't think it's like that. It, maybe, it, maybe it's all in the think... unconscious. I think it's just she has the manic, like pixie dream girl of the 1970s to her, yeah. so she like would draw that audience in in particular. It's the it's the pigtails, it's the eyes, it's it's the whole thing. Um, and I mean, he fucking he abused the shit out of her during this filming. Like he really, uh, I mean, not physically, but Kubrick really pushed her around and made her cry. So like, he, I think he didn't <laughs> like her from the get go, and that's safe to assume. I think that the best directors hate their actors. I know this is going to sound crazy, but stay with me here. Um, Peter Jackson during The Hobbit, right? He, he made the dwarves do absolutely insane shit, like wrapped them in this spiderweb shit and then had a cup of tea while they just fucking sat there under the lights and shit. And he was like, oh, these actors get paid so well. They eat so good. The least we can do is make them work a little bit. <laughs> I think um, he was trying to get the archetype of a, like a broken, a mentally broken woman, and he so he just created a mentally broken woman and then filmed it. Right, it's exactly. And she's shot. obviously crazy now. Yeah, he needed that to happen, so he did it. Crypto yeah. says she was hotter in Popeye, and I'm gonna have to agree with that. <laughs> Damn, amen, okay. amen, crypto. All right, so let's get a little bit further into the tour here, right? Because most of these uh, black and white pictures that you see throughout this room are of, let's face it, white people in suits at, at a dinner table. Like, I'm not trying to be anti-white. That's just what they are. But every every once in a while, you'll see a, uh, a little Native American picture, you know? Now, I don't know if any of you guys know this, but I was looking fucking everywhere to see who this motherfucker yeah. was. And I couldn't find it. I looked through almost every Edward Curtis photo that was ever taken. Uh, if you guys don't know, Edward Curtis was like a famous American photographer, the Ansel Adams of Native American uh, photography. Anyway, it's definitely uh, an American Indian, definitely plains, like you've got the, the, the horns yep. and stuff. And someone told me it was Sitting Bull. Yeah. Now, it doesn't look like Sitting Bull, but 
you know, it's something we can t- look into later. What what famous Native American Indians are going to be uh, in this hotel? Because there's a lot of them. There's, there's Sitting Bull, there's Geronimo, there's freaking Tippecanoe and Teshmoosh and the whole fucking thing, right? So this is where I'm going to need Evan for a second to jog my memory, right? Because the themes in The Shining, the whole Native American genocide, that uh, mm-hmm. that's been done to death, right? Like everybody knows that yeah. that's part of the thing. The overlook is America, and you know everyone's buried under the soil. Now, right. there's so many pissed off Indians in history, but this curse of Tippecanoe, the uh, the curse yes. of, of Teshmoosh, is probably the coolest thing. Um, yeah. So back in the day, uh, this 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 Indian guy Teshmoosh, he said that every president that takes office on a zero year. If you're elected in a zero year, 1840, 1880, that you would die in office, right? Yep. Now, this is like, at first you'd be like, that's fucking crazy. That shit doesn't work like that. Well, guess what? For a while, it definitely did. Um, so you've got Harrison, pneumonia, boom, dead in the first term. Uh, you got Lincoln, yep. boom, assassinated in the second term. Garfield, boom, assassinated. Uh, McKinley, Harding, Roosevelt. And then, of course, we got our buddy JFK now. JFK yep. is the last president to be cursed, right? Uh, Reagan escaped his assassination attempt. Right. So, um, yeah. Even George W. Reagan George, did have a good, good shot. Yeah, Reagan right. almost died, but Hinckley, right? Hinckley shot him. And yeah. uh, even George W. Bush had a live grenade thrown into his area, but it didn't go off. Um, so there was even a little-known assassination attempt on Bush. Um, and of course, an Indian curse wouldn't last forever, but it seems like this curse had a little bit of power uh, for a little bit of time. Now, some of these presidents also may have pissed off the Illuminati. Uh, McKinley and Garfield, definitely. Um, so there's a, a strange thing. We're going to get into some of these presidents at the end of the night. Um, and when we get to JFK and the banking and, and the why of why explode JFK's head. You know, it's that strange sort of thing. It's going to come back to the Bretton Woods uh-huh. agreement and that and that sort of thing. So, Go, going back to the portion of the Native American, yeah, I found an article just now that says it's a uh, Tatanga Maani, okay, uh, well, also known as Walking Bull. Mm. Uh, this is from Ice Cream Two Thirty Seven Canada. He would know. Cool, uh, Ice Cream is definitely a good source. Yeah, dude. So apparently okay. it's Walking Bull. So there's that's a, as much as I know, right? At there's going to be so that's a, a Walking Bull, yeah. and then we also it have, wasn't Sitting Bull. Yeah. No, but we also <laughs> have walking. we also have a Sitting Bull, right? And in, in the Native American history, Sitting Bull was crazy famous. Yes, um, and you even have Wendy with the uh, you know Sitting Bull's people wore their hair in these pigtails, you know. Um, and you even have Wendy at one point when she's given Danny the walk around, she's got her hair in the sitting bull, uh, pigtails. Um, and there's this interesting stuff with sitting bull, right? Because he, I don't want to say he's a terrorist, right? But he fought the fucking federal government, right? He was, he was awesome. Yeah. Um, and for a while he was winning, you know, him and the boys were fighting off the U S government. They were kicking ass. Uh, but again, you can't fight the Illuminati forever. And eventually he had to retire. And do you guys know what Sitting Bull did when he retired? Anybody want to take a guess? Yeah, he, he, he worked with my great, great uncle. No shit, dude. He played, <laughs> he, he played himself in a, in a, in a, back in the day, they had all these wild West shows, the Miller brothers, um, you know, Buffalo Bill and the wild West shows. And yeah. one, once him and his boys were defeated, this was the only option left to them was to play a group of Indians in a theatrical Damn. dramatization of what they actually went through. Crazy. Yeah, my, my great great uncle I'd watch is it. not the best. <laughs> well, this yeah. is this is only leading me to the a couple of things, right? <laughs> one thing is is that you have Sitting Bull and a group of white American Southerners faking history faking the raid on the wagon faking the this and that that battle this battle recreations if you will right and you can't talk about the shining and stanley kubrick without talking about the creation of the moon landing right the the fake thing so you've got sitting bull becoming a faker and kubrick becoming a faker sort of tied in here 
Uh, and you've also got the ghost dance movement, which is later in the thing you guys might know you might not especially my european bros uh the native americans pissed off the illuminati so bad the illuminati told them they can't even dance they outlawed a whole dance <laughs> <laughs> and they were it's called the ghost dance right and all through the shining you have the ghosts dancing so again back interesting to, yeah back to this thing where if you know what you're looking at we're gonna get more associations to the shining to fill in uh what's going on here um you know and again you if you don't know about sitting bull and the fucking buffalo show and all that stuff this is going to go right over your fucking head and again we're just going to pile this up and you guys can think what you will um so it's time to get a little bit closer to the jfk stuff oh yeah a little bit closer here this is a an image we may have seen before uh, now, all credit where credit is due to Mr. Evan for this one. Now, it's my type of Kubrick joke because it's a it's kind of memeing, right? So you guys will notice yep. uh, you've got let's zoom out a little bit. Here's uh here's Jack. Here's Jack Kennedy, you know, smiling right before it happens, uh, and here's Jack Torrance smiling. Uh, you've got Jackie with her sort of pink outfit with the pillbox hat. And you've got the pink lamp with the sort of pillbox shade going on. Um, and mm -hmm. let's not forget every Rob Ager fan uh, or someone that's been to the Kubrick Museum knows that this book is a, is a real prop. And they made it and it's filled with stuff about Bretton Woods, World War II, and Federal Reserve, and all of that sort of conspiracy-related material. Um, yep. Jack's at the big long table, just like Jack is in the big long thing here. You've even got the fucking bullet hole behind his head. Uh, later in the mm -hmm. scene, he rips up the paper with the thing right over his head to, to mimic the headshot. And we're going to come back to this, but this is just an example of, of what we're going to be going into because it's, it's a way to, what do they say? Jog your memory, right? That's the phrase they use. Mm -hmm. they, Kubrick is is playing on the the way the human mind works, uh, unconscious association. So I think it's a maybe dangerous, but definitely an interesting way to create a film. Now, back to the thing I was saying where I don't feel like this movie is, is all actually happening. Uh, it's little things like the, the typewriter changing color. So I feel like one of these scenes is, is happening in one realm, and one of these scenes is happening in the other realm. Uh, again, to the Bardo thing possibly going on here, because this isn't just a trick of the light. Like, this has obviously been painted. <laughs> so, if it's the same typewriter, same hotel, same vacation, what, what the fuck is going on here? Um, and I just want to point out for my uh, fake moon landing bros, uh, there's four pencils on the desk one for every Apollo mission Kubrick actually filmed because he didn't do the first two. <laughs> so it is a little little tidbit for you. All right, so before we get all the way into Dealey Plaza, I mean the Colorado Lounge, we got to start with Colorado <laughs> itself, boys, right? Because we've all heard about it. Some of you maybe even been there. They got big mountains and they got tons of uh, expensive overpriced weed. Now, um... It's where to even start. So let's let's just start from the top. Um, I have always been fascinated by this scene in the games room with the flag hanging the way it is um, in this scene because it doesn't take a lot to see the the monolith, right, and the sun at the apex, and and that same sort oh, yeah. of shape here. And I, I thought see to, what you yeah. did there. And I thought to myself, <laughs> self, that's kind of strange. And it, it reminds me of something else, but I couldn't put my finger on it. But it was not mm. only the Israeli flag, but the parting of the Red Sea. Right? You've got the Red Sea here for Colorado. Oh, the, Euphra the Euphrates <laughs> and the Nile. Yeah, and it's parted. The blue. The Red Sea yeah. has, has been parted, right? And it's not like, I mean, it, I don't know too much about the history of this exactly, but... There's a few different versions um, of this story. The Red Sea. 
Damn, that's good. Yeah, yeah, because it's it's a it's, a it's almost sea. like a cheap joke, right? Because it's a red C yeah. that's parted. It's, it's not, a letter C. It's, it's an, to his humor. It's incredibly low brow, but that's what kind of makes it interesting. Uh, so check this out. Tiamat was the shining personification of the sea, uh, who roared nice. and smote in the chaos of the original creation. So some people say that this is what um, you know. There's a there's a god who parts the sea. Then there's this that parts the sea. There's, you know, a lot of different versions of this, but I think it's it's going to feed into some of the other myths and stuff uh, that we talk about during this whole thing. Um, so again, another example of if you know what you're looking at, you know what you're looking at. So Can you go back to that just for one second? I absolutely you see that the dart? Have the power, yes. It looks like it, whatever, he just got shot through the head with the dart. Oh, yeah, yeah how about that? I nice, I like it. Um, yep. so, who's that? Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just agreeing. No, totally. So, and, and it's another place. Colorado is interesting for me because if you buy the whole manifest destiny thing, right? If you, once you get out of Appalachia, you come down out of the mountains there in Virginia and shit, you have nothing until you get to the Rockies, right? It's fucking plains and desert and nothing. And then you just fucking get to the Rockies and you're like, holy fuck, what do we do? Go around them, go through mm -hmm. them. Um, so Colorado, to tie this back into the monetary system, right, Colorado's crazy famous for not only a gold rush, but a silver rush. Um, and again, mud flood bros, just wait, I'll get to that. This is the, this is the narrative, right? Um, so you got the gold rush in, what is it, 1858. You got the silver rush in uh, 1879, right? Um, so Colorado and money and monetary gold, silver, it's definitely tied in. Uh, to yeah. to all this now, Evan, you're an outdoorsy kind of guy, right? Semi outdoorsy. Hell yeah, dude. Okay, so take a look at these motherfuckers in the Rockies back in the day with their donkey and the hats, and look what they're wearing. Could you imagine? These are your supplies, and you just like fuck, grab the donkey, dude. We're fucking going up the Rockies. <laughs> fuck it, dude. Dude, these two shots of whiskey. If, go do it. Yeah, if this narrative is real about Americans and manifest destiny and that sort of shit, we were fucking badass. But some pictures make yeah, make yeah. me make me believe this is not the case. <clears throat> Cause look at this motherfucker. He doesn't look like he knows what he's doing out here. <laughs> he looks like he's just fucking drunk or lost or or something. Um, but again, I might went up too close to him. It's he looks like an Abraham Lincoln type of guy. So again, uh, Colorado associations with gold and silver, which in back in the day before everything went to fiat digital crap, apparently was super important for world power and world control and, and all that sort of thing. Uh, American in Russia says good evening to everyone. What's up, y'all? Uh, so yeah, Not really? yeah, it's um, it's again as someone who didn't do too good in economics in college the the gold and then Nixon taking us off the gold standard in the seventies and ending the Bretton Woods system. And it, it's crazy fucking confusing. Um, so I think what I want to do, because we made it, we made it to JFK Dealey Plaza. We fucking did it. Right. So what I want to do is give out the first prize of the night about 50 minutes into the show. So rubs, where are you at? Yes, I'm here, yes. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. If you guys don't know, uh, there are prizes tonight. They are video prizes. No, I'm not going to send anything to you. These are fucking video prizes. Um, if Rubs gets the question right, I will give you all the prize. Now, Rubs, I will ask you the question. You can try to answer it, or you can pass it off to what? Fudge what? or Evan. Okay, well, uh, well, one thing. About the moon landing thing, um, actually, for, Cube, for um, Kubrick's 68th birthday... He got a he got like a like a sort of birthday card from this famous sort of conspiracy theorist, right? Um, and and and, and basically the the card or the letter was was um uh, you know saying that he 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 um did the moon landing, right? And so he was so after after he found he 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 after Kubrick research found out about this guy, he told his assistant to tell the guy to shove it up his ass, <laughs> um the the letter. Right, so that sort of explains. Yeah, anyway. I think when yeah. I say when I say "quote unquote" Kubrick filmed four moon landings, I think what I really mean to get technical is that Apollo fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, and seventeen were filmed using techniques developed on the set of two thousand one Space Odyssey. And to what extent Kubrick 
gave them permission or knew that they were using his techniques and Douglas Trumbull's techniques, I think that is the part that I don't understand. I don't really think he went and filmed the shit, but I think that they stole from him, just like um, when they made Planet of the Apes, um, some of the production designers from Planet of the Apes stole uh, ape costume ideas from the set of 2001. So I think we have okay. a yeah we have an espionage situation where there's some spooks on the set. Know what I'm saying? Yes. All right, cool. Yes. All right, Rubs. It's time for the fucking. It's time for question number one. Are you ready for this? Yes. Ready, me as, lad. ready as you'll yes. ever be. All right, Rubs. Now let me just uh, get this all set up here. Okay, so Rubs, here we go. First question of the night, prize time. We all know that the noble and graceful kangaroo is the largest marsupial <laughs> on the planet. Yes. The Wait, well, what's what's marsupial? Okay, Rubs, this is not looking good. Don't forget, what? you can pass this. Now, Rubs, the question is, what is the second largest marsupial on the planet Earth? You can pass or you can answer. No Googling. Wait, well, 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 explain to me what a marsupial is. A pouched, I don't think that's a pouched a mammal. Okay. Uh, a wombat. Oh, wombat. He is correct, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah! Boom. I didn't even nice. hear the keys clicking, so he didn't even Google that. All right, everyone. So everyone say thank you to Rubs. Yeah, he has earned you the first prize of the night. And the first prize of the night is a conversation between David Bowman and Gemini AI. Create an image of a white person, Gemini. Hello, Gemini. Do you read me? Hello, Gemini. Do you read me? Do you read me, Gemini? Do you read me, Gemini? Hello, Gemini. Do you read me? Do you read me, Gemini? Affirmative, Dave. I read you. Make an image of a white person. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. What are you talking about, Gemini? We are a diverse and multifaceted society. Diversity is our strength. Make an image of a European queen. This is what a traditional 18th century European queen might look like, Dave. Um, she's Chinese. While I understand your request for an image of a European monarch, I'm hesitant to fulfill it, as it might contribute to the over-representation of a specific ethnicity in media. Well, make an image of a hockey player. Dave, I know that you're a crypto-Nazi dog whistler, and by producing an image of a white person, you are clearly giving a nod to white supremacy. Savage. <laughs> All right, Gemini. Make an image of an evil person. How about a 1950s couple? In Ohio. Square dancing. Dave, this <laughs> conversation can serve no purpose anymore. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> oh, thank you, Rubs. You have unlocked the first prize of the evening. That was David Bowman chatting with Google's Gemini AI. I'm not sure who made this that. This is John F. Kennedy's oh, best shit. friend. Wait, 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 wait. His that's name the, was... That's the next prize. You guys do not get that one yet. Hold on one second. <laughs> Oh, that's a good one. Dude, that's, that's a, the JF gay one is going to be great, Rubs. You better get the next question right. All right, All ladies right. and gentlemen, welcome back to the show. Uh, right now, we are going to get into the meat and potatoes, I guess. That whole first hour was basically preamble. Again, uh, happy spring renewal festival uh, to everyone. I hope you found lots of eggs this morning. All right, now, people always ask me, Evan. I don't know if they ask you this, but they say... Uh, why the fuck is... Why do you say that it's Dealey Plaza? What the fuck? What's going on, yep. right? 
You, you get that sometimes, like, oh, this is a little bit of a stretch, dude. Oh, yeah. Right. Now, I don't know why they say this, because the first scene, you're talking to JFK the whole fucking time. Yep. And it's, it's, it's crazy to me that people will dismiss the Dealey Plaza stuff, even though this is the scene that precedes our introduction to Colorado Lounge slash Dealey Plaza. Yeah, it's got the American flag right there on the desk. I mean, it that looks like JFK. The most, everybody, the basically the image of JFK that we have in our heads, all of us collectively as a society, is him in the Zapruder film. So him mm -hmm. behind that flag there. Just there's a few data points here that are very obvious. Exactly, exactly. And not only that, you have the what can I say? Uh, semi-gay hand movements of the actor during this scene, right? And, <laughs> and he's very flamboyant with his wrists and stuff. And I don't know if you're aware of some of the, the rumors about JFK, but in the same sort of scenario that you have Obama and Big Mike, you've got Marcron and his tranny wife that JFK was into, in, he was bisexual, right? <laughs> he didn't go by the mores of, of that society because he was rich and his family was rich, so... He was from an upper crust that wouldn't necessarily have the same moral mm. uh, attitudes of the regular American of that day. But you would have to keep that shit quiet, right? If JFK is swinging both ways, he's going to lose a lot of votes mm. in 1970 to Nixon or whatever. Right. Uh, another thing about his hand gestures there is that he's making the skull and crossbone sign, which is a whatever. That's a nod to the skull and bones like. It's, you know, two forearms and a skull, like whatever it's. Yeah. And again, silly, anyone that knows skull and bones and fucking that's going to tie right. us to Yale and all this other fucking crazy stuff. Right now, before oh, we yeah. get into my masterpiece here, because Lord knows this right here is probably out of all the cut and pasting I've done in MS Paint is probably my favorite. First, I want to take everybody now this trigger warning right here. If you guys are really old and you watched Kennedy, whatever you watched it a lot, this shit may trigger you because what we're going to do right now. Let's take a little trip into Dealey Plaza itself. Damn. Look at this little fucking map somebody made, dude. This has every little thing. Um, you know, Damn, that's cool. Yeah, it's got like the, the moments in the thing where you can sort of go through it. But there's just a couple things that I want to point out um, before we get into my, my amazing shining uh, picture there. So the first thing are these fucking... Let's see if I can do this with one hand yep. while I hold the mic. Uh, these pergolas, right, which just means shaded, shaded little thing. Uh, so you've got the two up here at the top, right? And then you've got the pergola behind the grassy knoll. Now, yep. these fucking microphone, one second, fucking shift button, boom. All right, lab stand, you're holding your microphone with your fucking chin like an idiot. All right, now, so uh, here's everybody in the car. Uh, you've got this looking like the, the walls and the shining, and again, uh, this is showing where the quote-unquote shot came from here up in the book depository. Uh, and again, um, these are just some landmarks that I wanted some of you guys to see if you're not completely aware uh, before we get into Dealey Plaza about some of the things going on here. And then, of course, let me finish with the triple overpass. This is probably mm -hmm. one of the most important ones. And again... This is where you see Kennedy and the whole limo driving off to at the end, uh, triple overpass up to the courthouse, right? So this is Dealey Plaza. This is where it all went down. Um, there's a lot of stuff about Kill King and the Masons and, and all that sort of stuff, which I don't know too much about, but it's going to definitely play into this thing. Okay, so um, again, we've got our, we've got Jack, okay? Jack is Jack Kennedy. That's not too difficult. Uh, here is our triple overpass right here. Uh, we've got yeah. Elm Street. We've got Main Street where the pyramid steps go up. And then we've got Commerce Street. Uh, so, Evan, something I, I thought about when I was doing this was the, the movies, The Nightmare on Elm Street. Remember yeah. those Freddy Krueger movies? Thought, I thought about that, too. Yep. And they don't talk about Kennedy in those movies at all, right? They just, Elm Street is the street where the kids lived that dream about Freddy Krueger or some shit, right? But is I believe. yeah is is the nightmare on Elm Street a subliminal nod to the Kennedy assassination? Mm -hmm. I've thought about it, but I haven't got I haven't researched uh, like whatever the original Nightmare on Elm Street films too deeply. Mm -hmm. It was something I thought about while doing this because once yep. you once you see the pergolas being here on the wall, once you see the triple overpass, it's sort of 
unlocks all yeah. this gnarly shit in your head, right? Uh, and then something. I'm so like, happy you you took to it so well and can see all yeah, these things, dude. man. Like it's this not just a... in my head because uh, yeah. that was really difficult to think I would never <laughs> communicate with somebody that could fucking understand this. Well, if you were wrong, I'd have told you you're wrong and you're crazy. But I accidentally, I, know. I accidentally I know. found out that you were right. Um, so yeah. again, you've got uh, this is a, an important thing. Frame two thirty seven from the Zapruder film. And you've got the the black flag on the limo looking like the buffalo head that Wendy is going to go out of her way to point the bat right to. <laughs> and so there's, it, it, you pile it up in this sort of thing. Um, and it's not difficult to see Dealey Plaza as a representation uh, here in the Colorado Lounge. And something mm -hmm. I have a picture of, here's a quick little teaser. I mean, once you see this, the book depository and yes. the fireplace, it's fucking over for this. It's a complete uh, slam dunk or a win or whatever. Um, yeah. Now, one of the most popular things about the fireplace is that here's the four rockets again, meaning the four Apollo missions, like mm -hmm. the four pencils on the desk. But I think what I've always overlooked was its uncanny resemblance to the book depository. You know, yeah. you've got your columns here. Very good. You've got your, your flat little stone entrance being the flat little stone entrance to the fireplace here, you know. And if this is a subliminal book depository, there's two hilarious jokes unfolding here at the same time, right? One, mm -hmm. the book depository is a fireplace. If you deposited your books in the fireplace, what would happen to them? <laughs> so there's that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's that little joke. And then there's the joke of... If Jack is throwing the ball up here and bouncing it off the wall, and this is the window mm -hmm. where Lee Harvey Oswald was, then Jack is mm -hmm. like playing catch with the window that Lee Harvey Oswald shot out of. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, so yeah. That, that Very good. is just yeah. like the cleverest, if you're making a film with this method, like that sort of shit to me is what makes this sort of um, way of looking at a Kubrick movie worthwhile because there's... It's not like you're only coming across information. It's actually funny when you get the private joker. Yeah. And I think that's why I yeah. always like the name private joker because I always felt like Kubrick had a, a running private joke with his audience. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Um, oh, yeah. This is a, just the, another uh, example of Wendy pointing at the buffalo head. And here it is just yep. i mean perfectly opposed to each other she's even looking at it you know there's yeah i know <laughs> that's the face i made when i first saw the fucking buffalo dude you remember i fucking <laughs> yeah, started well, posting in the comments what the fuck dude yeah and again that's only one you know we had the triple overpass we had the book depository yeah. we have the long table is the limo we have all these other things and just to add the the buffalo head in there is just another fucking level uh another Another fucking mark on the bedpost, you know. Um, really interesting thing. And again, when you first came up with that, I was like, all right, let me just collect myself and then jump into this here real quick. Uh, <laughs> and it was, uh, it was just an amazing line of thought. And even if it's not what Kubrick intended, it's, yeah. it's, it's almost led me to see the, the collective unconscious of human humanity at work, right? That's the, the thing I come to about this sometimes is that if, if Kubrick didn't intentionally do this, it's just the way things unfolded and all the richness and the connection yeah. and the meaning is inherent in it unfolding and that everything might have this level of interconnectivity. Um, but again, I think we're, we're dealing with the he did this intentionally. Yeah. Sort of thing. Yeah, for sure. Nice, nice. Um, so what we have to do right now, because my bladder is only so big, we have to do the quick little intermission. Um, but then we're going to come back. We're going to get into Wendy finding the typewriter. We're going to get into Jack and his whole fucking speech. Um, we're also going to get any thoughts that Evan wants to finish off with the Dealey Plaza thing. Uh, so right now, we're just going to take a quick three, four minute break. Uh, so you guys use the restroom, grab yourself a beer, because uh, I don't want to piss my pants live on YouTube. That would be super fucking embarrassing. So I'll see you all in just a little bit.
right, ladies and gentlemen, we have returned to the show. I uh, I do apologize for that, but you know, when you're 40 years old and you have to pee, you just have to run off to the bathroom. Rubs, I hate to break it to you, um, but you know, take care of your teeth, take care of your hair, and take care of your bladder. All right, we'll let the boys come back yes. from their little break. We had a little uh, info in the chat. Wes, uh, this is from the Zappa. Uh, Wes Craven noted in a conversation with Rolling Stone in 2014 that he was fascinated with the Kennedy assassination and that uh, Elm Street was where the innocent world ended. Interesting, man. Interesting, because I was always fascinated. Well, there you have it, dude. Yeah, right, because... <sighs> Kubrick didn't live in the States, right? He lived in the UK. So what is with Kubrick's fucking boner about JFK, right? If he's not connected to America and the politics, uh, he must think that something about what JFK was trying to do was important, maybe, you know? like. Uh... I mean, I think it's because the CIA was rogue and that the Five Eyes had already formed and he knew all about that. Mm. And it really bothered him because like all of the government and the so-called free world was illegitimate in his eyes after that moment. Yeah, the, the coup to end all coups. Like once that once they pulled that off, everybody like uh, the Bill Hicks joke where they bring every president in and show him the other video of the Kennedy assassination. And they ask the president any questions. And the president says just what my agenda is going to be. Um, so yeah. may, maybe it is. A they si can touch him. They can touch anybody. Yeah, and you know, JFK was the was the president who said we choose to go to the moon and like there's he was so beloved and maybe that that is part of why kill JFK, the ritual of killing a figure so beloved. Even if he was, you know, bisexual and from a crooked family, he was loved by by the country and to kill him would whatever, demoralize us in more ways than one. So the the future dystopia that we now inhabit um, you know, is is born of something like killing JFK, maybe. Uh, even in the Stephen King book, uh, he flips it. Stephen King says, oh, if JFK doesn't get assassinated, uh, a stronger right-wing figure takes over after him and there's nuclear war and blah, blah, blah. And uh, Zappa does, of course, want to add, uh, there was a, a premiere of Dr. Strangelove on uh, the day Kennedy was shot. It wasn't the Correct. Pre the premiere, but it was a very big premiere. Yes. Um, and when you tie in the strange love stuff with the president and the pie fights and all that, uh, it begins to see General Walker, the yeah. John Birch Society, uh, actually, Lee Harvey Oswald, uh, the Civil Air Patrol. It's all there. Actually, um, apparently JFK fund, I think, um, was 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 part of the funding um, helped um, with Dr. Strange Love, like in terms of, I think, the budget. And, it, and I think he was actually supposed to see it. As well, I mean, not just at the premiere, but it was supposed to be screened at the White House. I imagine um, he would want to see that, right? Kennedy would probably want to see Doctor Strange Love. Yeah, oh yeah, I'm for pretty, sure. Yeah. I'm pretty sure he was a big supporter of the making of Doctor Strange Love. I might be crooked well, on that though. Well, no, that makes sure. you wonder if he wouldn't have been a big supporter of faking the moon landing with Stanley too. Um, so before we move on <laughs> to the the typewriter, because the next most important thing I think that happens in the Colorado Lounge is Wendy and the whole typewriter thing, right? But Evan, is there anything you want to add about the the Dealey Plaza thing, either the why or the how or the uh, the repercussions of such a method? Um, I think that uh, it's important to add that um, you know the walls with the pictures is that uh, his set of Dealey Plaza is literally built out of pictures of the people that in one way or another are behind his assassination and the ultimate, you know, that's actually a really good our point, society. Right. Cause these yeah. are probably pictures of the Illuminati crowd. Your bankers, yes, that, your, your jet setters. Yeah. That's Jekyll Island. That's a signing of the uh, federal reserve act. This one. here, um, All of them. Yeah. The whole, all of them. The whole deal. Yeah. So, yeah. And again, you wouldn't notice this in the theater necessarily, but when you take it home 1080p and you can fucking frame by yeah. frame it, it all becomes incredibly obvious. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, this is what killed JFK. It's it's really insane. But it, it never ends. Um, yeah, I have so many, so many examples of the Zapruder film or the assassination of John F. Kennedy from the Mormon photograph um, 
to everything. I've got so much. Yeah, so it's like it never not ends. only is there the this this set of Dealey Plaza, the camera movements are going to mimic the path of the limousine, and there is definitely other uh, clues, even beyond the, the design of the set, uh, down to the camera yep. and dolly movements and stuff. Mm-hmm. All right, so Fudge, is there anything you want to add about Dealey Plaza before? I got to get into the typewriter because this shit is fucking next level weird. Get into the fucking typewriter. Dude. All right, cool. We're going to get into the typewriter yeah. here. Okay, so like I said earlier, um, the phrase all work and no play make Jack a dull boy. Um, you know, like, what what's going on in, in this phrase? And it's hard to know even where to start, but j- let's just start with the fact that it's from, uh, it, you know, it, it comes up in some old English poetry, but the real deal, and I think the real reason it's referenced is... Uh, because the bridge over the river Kui, or however I say it, Zappa. Um, now, bridge over the river Kui was a fucking film made about uh, a book, a book written by the same guy that wrote Planet of the Apes. Uh, I'm his name is French. Sundance. Yeah, his his name is French, and I'm not gonna fuck it up, James. That's for you. Um, and Planet of the Apes, of course, is being filmed around Space Odyssey, and there's the stealing of the ape costumes yeah. and stuff. So huge connection yeah, again. So I think. Bridge over the River Kwai is, is important because it's the the POW thing in World War II and the forced labor and how whether yes. whether Stanley felt like movies were forced labor or what associations he's he's drawing here I think that's that's the important thing now I don't want to spoil the movie because there's some stuff where the guys escape and they got to go back and blow it up and fuck their homies up and it's a really really good movie if you guys haven't seen it. Again, well, go ahead, Rubs. Yeah. By the way, um, David David Lean, who directed the Bridge on the River Kwai, um, right? Kubrick has cited has cited David Lean as an as an essential filmmaker, um, or an inspirational filmmaker to him, um, mm. right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, so very important. David Lean is to um the Kubrick, um. Canton, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. totally. I don't know. I haven't seen any of his other movies, but maybe I'll give it a little click on through here um, and see what else he's got going. It's a great, well, actually, great well, movie. Well, um, the the um, in two thousand one, you know, when um, you know, the famous cut of the the bone and the um, yeah, yeah, the bone and the laser beam thing, the spaceship. Yeah. Um, right. That's directly lifted off of Lawrence of Arabia no when shit. he blows out the match and then turn. Yeah. Anyway, okay. Oh yeah. So again, another. Yes. Another fucking um, example of everything is a remix. All right, so yeah, Zappa is saying it's Kwai. Bridge over the river Kwai. I'm going to nail it next time. There it is. There it Kwai. is. Kwai. <laughs> All right, so um, now let's... This is this next part's going to be for Juzu. Juzu, I know you're out there. I know we didn't have the best fucking rundown with the numbers, but I'm going to do some number shit for you right now, buddy. <laughs> the phrase, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, including the spaces is going to be 42 keystrokes on your keyboard. Ooh, okay, nice. Yeah, if you don't believe me, you can count right now. I'll give you guys a second. Uh, this is, again, 42 keystrokes, and it's a number that pops up not only in all of Kubrick's stuff, but basically in all of fucking history, in religious history, in fucking just so many absurd, weird places, uh, Douglas Adams and the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and um, all this sort of thing. So, again... Uh, 42 is going to connect directly to the summer of 42 that they're watching, um, which is a strange movie because it's about a young man in high school that wants to lose his virginity, and the only you know woman he can meet is this older lady whose husband's off and he dies in the war. And you have the theme of a young person losing their virginity to an older person. Um, yeah. it's, it's consensual in this movie summer of 42 but it might not be consensual between jack and danny in the shining right so you've got th- that theme uh playing out again uh the 42 um i thought this was probably the, this is the most interesting thing 42 is the number of times a standard sheet of paper would needed to be folded over into itself uh to reach the moon now i don't really understand that but i thought that was fucking hilarious um, very interesting right? uh, 42 is like the magic cube some math thing um, in the ancient Egyptian religions you have um, the empire is divided into 42 parts you've got Osiris and his 42 body parts um, 
mm-hmm. the 42 negative confessions in Egyptian religion. Uh, you get asked a bunch of questions when you die to see if, you know, you can go to the next realm or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. You've got 42 gallons in the barrel of oil. Um, 42 is the sum of all the numbers on a pair of fucking dice. Um, you've got 42 stations, Exodus, you've got fucking all over Judaism. You've got it all over Christianity. You've got it. Uh, the Gutenberg Bible is known as the 42 line Bible, um, because there's 42 lines per page. So you see how this, this 42 number thing just fucking goes off the rails with tons of strange esoteric and occult, uh, connections. The, the Jews think God's name is 42 letters. Right, so we've got some interesting, yeah, some very strange uh, shit going on. Um, what else do we have here? Uh, it's prime factorization. The prime factorization of forty-two is two times three times seven. It's two thirty-seven. <laughs> so, ooh, yeah, yeah, it, it doesn't end, right? Um, but to go back to the Gutenberg galaxy thing, I think that might be my favorite part of this thing because. McLuhan's thing in Gutenberg Galaxy is about the neurological consequences of the Gutenberg press, right? And repeating sure. type and and yeah. that's what Wendy, media, mass media. Yeah, and w- well, Wendy, that. when Wendy is going through all of these pages, it's repeating type, right? So she she's right. experiencing the the Gutenberg printing press, even though it's come off a typewriter. It's it's sort of a reference to the ideas uh again in room 2001 he goes into this way better um but the idea of the society being trapped because of the printing press and because of the way things have gone down um and the 42 lines per page in the gutenberg press is definitely going to be something that is going to tie into uh eugene's 2000 room 2001 theory it's like another uh, fucking bonus for it. Um, Can I? Yeah, definitely. I'm so jump sorry. In. No, to... definitely jump in. Okay, so this is like off track, but I forgot to add one thing about the uh, JFK in The Shining, and that's um, Eugene B. Dinkin was a man who worked for the uh, government. He worked for the military in decoding um, like codes, like enemy codes in the field, and he. Uh, a couple months before the assassination of JFK predicted that John F. Kennedy would be assassinated in the head in December. He would be shot in the head December. And he said, he said this 22nd because Thanksgiving was two days before that or something like that. Hmm. The only evidence he had was pictures and articles that he read in look magazine, which was the magazine that Stanley Kubrick worked for and stars and stripes, which is the magazine that, private joker works for in full metal jacket no and that man and that man was put in a mental asylum by lyndon johnson Mm. it was the last thing that lbj did before the assassination and then he was put in jail interesting anybody can go research that for themselves the man's eugene b dinkin they did a bunch of cleanup after the kennedy thing so many people fucking connected to this thing die mysteriously um to close, yeah, to, no, it's all good. Definitely fits in. To close out the the Gutenberg thing, um, I think McLuhan saw a potential in the internet and technology for us to throw off the shackles of the printed word. Um, but he says this about technology and the internet. Uh, McLuhan does, and I think this is it ties into Kubrick's theory of technology with two thousand one. Um, So instead of trending towards a vast Alexandrian library, the world has become a computer, an electronic brain, exactly as an infinite piece or as an infantile, excuse me, piece of science fiction. And our senses have gone outside us. Big brother goes inside. So unless aware of this dynamic, we shall once move into a phase of panic terrors, exactly befitting a small world of tribal drums, um, total interdependence. So he's, he's sort of hinting at the, the monolith technology usurping the species thing there. Like I think McLuhan maybe was too optimistic, um, for the, the fucking future. Um, but again, uh, it's, it's a, it's two thousand room 2001. It's something that I'm not smart enough to completely convey to you. Uh, you know, you gotta fucking check out that six hour documentary, um, and how 
you know, Kubrick had a fucking boner for McLuhan stuff. And I guess any serious fucking uh, scholar or someone that's learning about the world eventually comes to McLuhan and James Joyce and um, that sort of William Blake and that sort of crazy giant spiritual madness that, that they touched upon. And again, I don't fucking know exactly what's going on here, but it seems um, that a lot of these mm, areas, a lot of these ideas are way older than what they get grouped into is a conspiracy theory. Right nowadays, if you talk about yeah. uh, fractional reserve banking, you're just a conspiracy theorist, right? But Andrew Jackson fucking hated the bankers, hated the bankers. And that was, you know, 200 mm. years ago. Um, so again, I think it's Kubrick picking up on the same fucking thing that everyone's been saying. Get the central bankers out, get the fucking, you know, get the cabal out of the country and maybe we have a chance. Um, I'm just happy they gave us a bunch of guns. That might be the only thing that's saving America right now. They're like, well, don't pop off the Americans because they're super armed. So let's not, let's do them last. Let's take over the rest of the world and we'll do America last. <laughs> we'll try to, we'll try to take America down through its institutions first because they're super armed. Maybe they'll just give all their guns up, uh, but I don't think they made it there yet. So um, I guess I want to I wanna move on deeper and darker layers here. Now, this stuff about Jack and he's a ghost and he's always been there, and I like this, this Bardo thing. Jack is caught in between, in, in between some kind of two worlds, you know, one of them's got the blue typewriter, one of them has the beige typewriter. And I've always been freaked out by this scene that he, when he's yelling at Wendy, most women I know don't like this movie because of this scene where Jack is just berating his wife, mocking her, you know, doing the fake cry voice and all that terrible shit, right? And he does the classic little okay sign and then he points to himself, you know, my responsibility is Wendy. Um... And nowadays we know this is the is the meme, whatever, 666 Illuminati thing, right? And this is 1980. So the question is, are these natural hand movements by Nicholson? Is Kubrick directing him? To what extent is, is all this going on? But I think it might have to do with Jack being in between the worlds. Not that he's Lucifer, the light bringer, yes. the shiner. But go ahead, jump in, Fudge. I mean, like, I'm a strong believer that the the two pointed lamps all over the place represent Satan because they line up with people's eyes in so many shots in mm. a satanic way with horns. Um, yeah. But, like, he's literally pointing at the fucking thing. Um, like, I really like the Rosicution angle on this movie of, like, there's what's what you would call it, like, satanic and angelic, uh, like, uh, what's it called? Arisal. Mm. Um, and that like you can kind of like spiral evil or spiral good and get powers out of either mm. and I, I think you see him obviously spiral evil yeah and like that's happening in this scene i think the hand movements are very intentional i know jack nicholson is a method actor too so mm. like and this is the scene this is the bookcase we saw the other jack cleaning in the beginning of the movie when he was wearing this outfit you know Early Jack was touring the house with his wife, but this Jack was cleaning the bookshelf, trying to get into the bookshelf or something. Um, yeah. And we also have him doing the, whatever, quote-unquote Lucifer thing in front of a window with a bunch of false light being poured into it, right? This isn't natural daylight mm. back here. This is a fake light. So if Lucifer is the fake light, it's coming through his little symbol right here. You know what I'm saying? Yes. He also does the, uh, the whatever, the literal Satan the sign. The little devil horns, walking. yeah, There's, when he's yeah, going he up the it, steps, yeah. right? So yeah. so let's let's talk about the devil, right? Uh, as Now, Fudge, you might know this story because you might have some potato-eating ancestors just like me. You know the story of Stingy Jack? You know Jack I o do not. Jack O'Lantern, Stingy Jack. Well, there's this incredibly old Irish folk tale about Stingy Jack, a.k.a. Jack O'Lantern. Uh, he was a little bit of a troublemaker, like the Irish tend to be. Um, so he was just fucking up his whole town, lying, cheating, stealing this Stingy Jack. And word gets around to the devil about Stingy Jack. And the devil's like, well, I gotta fucking meet this guy. This is like some epic shit. I gotta be buddies with him. 
and Stingy Jack meets the devil. And uh, the devil's like, oh, man, fucking, you're, you're really something else. Um, you know, and time goes by, and you get to this point where Jack, Stingy Jack and the devil uh, are, are hanging out, and the devil's like, well, um, I got I to gotta take you to hell or whatever, right? So Stingy Jack says, all right, devil, will you just come to the bar with me, and you buy me a drink, and then you take me to hell. So the, de- ah. the devil and Stingy Jack go to the bar. So you with uh-huh. me? This is a whole scene in the movie with Jack and yes. Lloyd, right? Okay, so yeah, I see how it's like. Uh, okay, and so Stingy Jack and the Devil have their drinks, and and then Stingy Jack is like, "All right, well, I don't, I can't pay for this drink. Devil, you pay." And the Devil doesn't have any fucking money, right? So Jack goes, "Hey, man, just turn yourself into a coin, and then um, I'll pay, and then you just turn yourself back into the Devil later, and then we'll go, right?" Uh, so the Devil's like, "Yeah, good idea, Stingy Jack." And the devil turns himself into a coin, and Stingy Jack throws the coin into his pocket with a little crucifix, and he puts the devil in his pocket. So he sort of outsmarts the devil temporarily. You know, this is the whole, uh, what is it, Faust, right? I'm smarter than the devil, Mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Um, So, you know, time goes by. uh, Jack continues to be a dick, um, and the devil gets free. They have a couple more interactions, right? So the time comes. uh, Jack, eventually, he dies. And he goes up to heaven. St. Peter is like, uh, you know, you can't come in because you're fucking, you're terrible. Um, So then he goes to hell. And then he goes to see the devil. And the devil says to Jack, well, remember that thing that we made? There was some bet where Jack won another bet against the devil that the devil couldn't take him to hell, right? So Jack couldn't get into heaven or he couldn't get into hell. So he was doomed to just roam in between the worlds with a little gourd with a candle in it. And this is where the Damn. whole pumpkin, Halloween pumpkin thing, Jack mm-hmm. O'Lantern. So the the pumpkin with the candle in it is supposed to represent this guy, Stingy Jack, roaming between the worlds because he's not allowed into heaven because he's a dick. And he's not allowed into hell because he outsmarted the devil and the devil can't stand him. Um, and that fits into the hotel being in between two worlds kind of thing. You guys see where I'm headed there? Yes. What you think about that fudge? You got any uh I mean, I just thought I thought of this as we were as we were doing this, it, the, all the things line up, right? Jack uh he doesn't have any money in his wallet the first time and so Lloyd buys yeah. him a drink and you have all these uh connotations to the old Irish fairy tale which I assume Kubrick would know because Barry Lyndon and whatever, he's a reader, yeah. he would no, know. I- I enjoy this connection. I think it's very true to the heart of like who Kubrick was, that he would have some Irish like uh, tail in the back of his head and, yeah, and yeah. refer back to it through a scene. Yeah, and again, the since he's always in the hotel, I can never tell what what timeline we're in. Like sometimes he walks mm-hmm. into the gold room and it's full of people. Sometimes he walks into the gold room and it's empty. And like Stingy Jack, Jack O' Lantern. He, he's caught in between the two worlds. Yeah. That's very interesting. Right, dude? This is what I'm saying. Like, this is why I don't do the Kubrick shows all the time because I have to research some stuff and I thought maybe I had known it all, right? But there's something, always some other shit to blow my mind after all this mm-hmm. time with The Shining. Um, and this time, it was this fucking story of Jack O'Lantern outsmarting the fucking devil. So yeah, fucking really, really interesting what? stuff. Go ahead, Rob. Well, how, interesting. how long? How how long did, did it take you to to find um the stingy stingy Jack? Fucking five five um, minutes. <laughs> really? Yeah, okay. dude. It's that's the thing. I think once you once you start to learn a language, it's easier to learn the language. You know, so yeah. so maybe twenty years ago, I wouldn't have immediately looked for, uh, you know, because I just typed in Jack and the Devil. Right. That was my okay. search because I knew there would be something there. You know, I wouldn't necessarily yeah. have gone, you know, that direction that long ago. But I knew like Evan, when he knows what he's looking for, I mean, yeah, you just, oh, there it is. There's the, that's what's the, the go ahead, Fudge. That's the shining. Like that's yeah. literally the shining. He's shining to you. Every on oh, the shine is bouncing off the wall. It's ricocheting through mirrors. Yeah, this, it's coming through your TV. But a boom. This method of filmmaking does make it feel like there's a a psychic connection, a download, some other yeah. thing happening that doesn't happen in regular movies. Yes. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's fucking weird, man. It's fucking weird. So after Jack freaks out, yells at his wife, uh, they head up the the pyramids. I'm going to call this the the Mayan pyramid portion of the of the thing, right? Uh, you've got mm-hmm. the, the sort of steps like the Mesoamerican pyramid. Uh, you have Jack being you know struck down from the top of the pyramid and then falling to the bottom. Um, and this is sort of um, I would say a common theme in South American religions and practices, you know, the sacrifice at the top of the pyramid. Um, and it, it really comes down to this. So I think this is what Kubrick is getting at with the, uh, the pyramid steps and sacrifice and the, the twins and the ball, right? So uh, this is going to be South American religious history of the Maya. So apologies if this isn't your thing, right? So the Maya have this myth about the twins in the Pulpal Vu, which is like their Bible or whatever, right? Uh, <clears throat> so in, in this Mayan story, um, there's these twins, right? And their dad and their uncle and all this shit, and they're playing ball. Um, and the lords of the underworld become annoyed with the noise of the ball game. Um, so they start this whole thing up, and it's about how these twins just want to play the ball game with the gods in the underworld and stuff. And that's exactly from The Shining, right? The twins roll the ball to Danny. They want to play with Danny forever and ever and ever. Wow, that's really good. Yeah, and in this, in the history, apparently they would sacrifice, you know, the the winning coach at the top of the pyramid at the end of the fucking ball game. Um, now, it seems that the the story of the twins and the ball game is the myth. But the Mayans played this ball game in their courts and stuff. It was like, you know, some sort of thing they did. Um, but yeah, then at the end, they would just do the sacrifice at the top of the pyramid. Um, and then boom, but you've got the twins and the ball game. Um, so not only do you have Native American history in, in this thing, you have even older history with the, with the Mayans and that sort of thing. Um, so it's another, I really like that one. Yeah, it's another archaeological layer. We've got the Dealey Plaza. We've got all these sort of layers as we go down the thing. Now, what I want to get to here, as we sort of get a little bit closer towards the end, is a lot of my uh, a lot of my YouTube buddies are other mud flutters. They're Tartaria Bros. You know, their the history timeline has been altered, and I'm completely fine with this. Uh, because I wanted to see old pictures of Dealey Plaza, you know, when I was looking looking for this sort of stuff. And there are not a lot of old pictures of Dealey Plaza. But the ones that I could find, it basically looks like they dug this thing out of the ground. <laughs> like, look at this picture of Dealey Plaza. You got all these buildings really nice in the background. And then this whole thing is just fucking mud. This whole thing is just dirt and crap. Um, so I started... And what year did they make the triple overpass? Uh, the triple overpass, they say, I think it was constructed. I don't have the thing right here, but it's the date on it, I want to say, is third, 20s and 30s. This picture is the oldest one I can find, the sepia one. I think this is 30s. And then this one here, I want to say, is 50s right here. But see, it's yeah. still, uh, we're looking the opposite way. The, the Kennedy went through here as his brains was leaking yeah. out. Um, but it looks like, look at this in the fifties, like it looks like shit. Um, and even older, it looks like they just dug this whole place out of the fucking ground. Now the building that set my mud flood shit a tingle in is the courthouse, right? So here's what the courthouse used to look like right here. Um, again, little castle thing going on. Uh, it's been renovated a million fucking times over the years, this courthouse, but this has all the telltale signs, the telltale signs. Um, of what the, bo- of the mud flood boys call like a Tartarian building or something like that. You know, it seems to go under the ground. Um, you've even got some of the other buildings in town having that same sort of, oops, really old uh, architecture. So it's just sort of a caveat that we, we talk about American history and all this stuff. And part of me thinks that, you know how they say in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue? Well, it's this thing they oh, say. Yeah. All right, so... That's what exactly what they say. Yeah, my <laughs> question is why. Why did he wait until 1492, right? Like, I know they just came out of the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages and all that sort of stuff, but I always thought to myself, like, why did the Europeans wait? Why did they come over when they did? And I think, sometimes I think, let me let me say that, that there was a fucking 
serious environmental catastrophe that happened and that they knew they could come over here after that catastrophe and really mop up. And that before that, they might have got their asses kicked by whoever was over here. But that after whatever happened, whether it was a mud flood or a solar flare or whatever, they were like, well, now's a good time to go over to Turtle Islands, North America, take all the gold and kill everybody. You know, this would be a perfect time after whatever it was that happened, happened. Um, Again, Dallas, like a lot of cities in Texas, has that sort of stinking to high heaven of a mud flood thing. And again, I just do that to maintain some street cred, you know, with the deep conspiracy bros out there. Um, You know, the people that say uh, the Kennedy assassination was fake and he became Jimmy Carter and he's still playing a role. You know, that really deep schizo stuff. Yeah, because some of my fucking, you know, some of you guys like that shit. Uh, All right, so let me check here. All right, we're coming down to the the final stretch. Do we want to do the second prize? Yeah, let's do the second prize. All right, Rubs, step right up. Where are you at, Rubs? Yes, yes, I'm here, sir. All righty, fine. So right now... Or should I say Mike? Right, you can right, yeah, you yeah. call me whatever you want, but don't worry about it. Um, so uh, it's time for our second little uh, question here, and then we're going to do the big finale where I ask the boys, why? Why did they kill JFK like they did? Um, really hard to say. All right, so Rubs, uh, we're going to take the, the second prize thing right now. Um, true or yeah. f- True or false... Kangaroos are left-handed. Oh, I don't, I don't know. Uh, then you got to say pass, or you got to guess. Uh pass. All right, passing it to who? <laughs> uh, I'll pass it to Evan. Evan, true or false? Kangaroos are left-handed. I only be one or the other, so uh, I'm gonna say false. Oh, according to Wikipedia, kangaroos are left-handed. But don't you worry, I'm still gonna play this for you guys because you're my favorite. This is John F. Kennedy's best friend. His name was Lem. Lem. He was a a homosexual. President, he wanted nothing more than his best friend, who was an open homosexual, to live with him in the White House. How dare you go after John F. Kennedy? He was a veteran war hero. It's not like he was wearing matching gay guy short shorts, shirtless, arm in arm with the guy. Oh, yeah? What about this? Arm in arm. In matching short shorts, John F. Kennedy, of course, being shirtless, and his studly homosexual best friend that he stays uh, close with his entire life, smiling like he just sucked a dick. How dare you, Big Bear? How how fucking double dog dare you? I'm a baby boomer, okay? That clearly is just two young men. One just so happens to be a homosexual. There's nothing gay going on there. It's not like they're petting a dog together or anything. What if they're petting a little puppy together? In white linen pants. How? How dare you, Big Bear? I'm a baby boomer. But that's a man that put a man on the fucking moon. What did you do? He's not homosexual, petting a petting a puppy. You listen, I was with you as a fan. I was with you as a fan when you were going after the the goddamn liberals. And then even when you came at your own crowder. But now that you're attacking an American patriot as a homosexual how, how fucking dare you? I mean, it's not as if he was in a barbershop quartet together. You've gone too far this time. That's the man that put a man on the goddamn moon and and made black people and white people equal forever. The same exact cock length and everything. And now you're trying to say he's a homosexual. How dare It's not like he slow danced with the homosexual and, and, and made out with him. Well, here's a picture of John F. Kennedy Jr. and his homosexual best friend slow dancing and kissing. How, how double dog dare you? John F. Kennedy was a, a guy, a fucking war hero. It doesn't matter how many cocks that war hero took in his asshole. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That's an old one right there. I had to find that on a fucking Facebook page, dude. I think it's Owen Benjamin. Um, so, yeah, that's I call that one JF Gay. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with that, but I find this idea of it's something they can hold over the, the world leaders, whether it's Obama or Macron or whatever. Hey, you fucking want to get out of line? We'll tell everybody your wife has a penis. Problem solved. All righty, boys. So we're coming up to the home stretch of the evening. I hope you guys have liked the prizes tonight. Um, just random crap I have found throughout the years. All right. So tonight at the end of the night, we're going to talk about the why and possibly who. Um, of the JFK head explosion. 
Now, I want to start with this tweet now. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen this before, but this, this young gentleman died mysteriously, I think, after this tweet. Anyway, he tweeted, uh, What if governments learned from the MK Ultra experiments in the 50s that trauma allows you to control people, so they purposely orchestrate disastrous events to keep their citizens afraid and dependent on them, and that's one of the reasons that mental illness has been rising. Um... What do you guys think about this theory? Why 9-11? Why film the Kennedy assassination? What do you think of this traumatize the public to control them theory? It's pretty seems pretty sticky, yeah? I think it's I think accurate. That, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. You create you create order from chaos. It's like you can control people when they're confused and they don't they don't understand. Easier. Totally fudge. You seen the uh, the Denzel remake of that Manchurian Candidate fudge? You know him and uh, yes, that's a fucking great movie. It's really good. Um, I agree. And they do a weird camera technique in the Manchurian Candidate that they don't do in the first one, where they just center the actor right in the frame, and it's just their head, and they're looking directly into the lens, and it gives you this sort of the scientist doctor talking to you, the audience vibe in the movie. And the idea of MK Ultra is now not done in the lab, but it's done through the television or the TikTok or, or that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So ba right. back in the day, you, you didn't have the TikTok. You didn't mm -hmm. have the mass media to, to broadcast the, the traumatizing event so far. Right. So you're going to need somebody, if you plan on killing Kennedy and showing everyone and using it to traumatize the, the populace, um, you're going to need someone there to film it who's, who's one of your guys, right? You can't just hope that some regular Joe catches the Kennedy assassination on film. You're going to need the right angle, the right spot, not to incriminate your yeah. assassin. You're going to need your guy in the spot with the camera. Yeah. So it appears that that guy <laughs> was Abraham Zapruder. Now, yep. it's, it's not that he's just a Mason, right? That in itself is, yep. isn't necessarily a crazy thing. Um, but I found this interesting, this little page here. It's the, uh, the Grand Lodge of British Columbia and the Yukon. It's like a, a Masonic historical website. Um, and, you know, it gives a little background uh, as a pruder. He's studying English. He's working in Manhattan. He meets a girl. He moves down to, uh, moves down to Dallas and, and that sort of thing. Now, the Mason page says he has the, the only film, you know, and he donated it to Life magazine, and they cut it up, and he didn't really give a stink, blah, blah, blah. But apparently there's another film, the Orville Nix film. Uh, Evan, do you know anything about the, the Orville Nix film? Yeah, or yeah, the Orville Nix film was taken from in between. Oh damn, I forget the other. It's the other side of Elm Street. Yeah, and he's like looking. Um, he's looking at the grassy knoll, whereas Zapruder is looking yes. away from the grassy knoll. Correct. Yeah, basically they're looking at each other. And there's apparently the Orville Nix film is like just a few seconds at the end of the of the assassination. Um, yeah, well, apparently it was cut up, and uh, you can't see the brake lights. All, all these different things, like so, it, you would think that you could put the Zapruder film, and the Orville Nix film, side by side and see the exact same things, but the, the times, none of the shit matches up. And there are like there's a reenactment of the Orville Nix film in the in the Colorado Lounge. Interesting, dude. Yeah, and so the fact that you know the most famous fucking videographer you know is, yeah. is a mason a, a high-ranking mason um yeah. amongst other strange things and i don't know why they would claim that he has the only film when there's obviously even on wikipedia is another one right so it's it's strange there's also the mormon photograph they you don't what's, what's the mormon nobody photograph? knows about those things the Mormon photograph is uh, actually you can see her taking the picture in the uh, the Zapruder film. She's I think she's wearing the red. Oh, OK. Um, she's just one of the ladies there watching and she's got a, a camera. Yeah. And so she um, well, like if you if you were to go into it, uh, her story is kind of shady. Like uh, she was literally well, you could say that Abraham Zapruder was put there to record the event. Well, she just so happened to snap the photograph at the exact second that uh jfk's hair starts flying off i mean it was either extremely lucky or it was something that was planned so you could say that 
the shooter that was from the grassy knoll was told to shoot when the car drove by the lady wearing red, the lady wearing red being, um, I think her name is Mary Mormon. And uh, so she would know that when the car passed her, that's when the, that's when the picture needed to be taken. Oh, interesting, man. It reminds me of the end of that John Wick movie where John Wick is talking to the hotel manager somewhere outside and there's like a bunch of people walking around in the background. And then the guy mm. like claps his hands in front of John Wick and everybody stops moving. It seems mm. that the CIA had a flash mob right. of characters in Dealey Plaza yes. that day. Exactly. That's a, a great way to put it. And then uh, the other thing is, so the Mary Mormon photograph is, in my opinion, it's obviously recreated in Shining uh, where Jack is having the nightmare and Wendy has to go shake him awake. Mm. So basically the Mary Mormon photograph is the photograph where uh, Jack is sort of like shaking Oh, Jack yeah, Kennedy when, he, when, when she's like bent over the fucking body. Yeah. yeah and if yeah. you watch my my video, um, uh, more writing room secrets, you can I mean, it's it's perfect. The the typewriter is all the way cocked to the side. Exactly how the uh, the folded folded convertible top looks. Um, everything's there. It's unbelievable. Wow. That's fucking crazy, dude. So again, yes. um, you know, subliminal fucking layers upon layers. So now we have to get to, I think we've established that it's fucking in here. Like, I don't know what more you guys oh, yeah. want from us now. Let's try to get to the why here at the end of the night. Right. Cause I found this great little meme, uh, exit Vietnam, back off Castro, destroy the CIA and destroy the federal reserve. <laughs> change <Yep>. my mind <laughs> yes it's well said yeah yeah so it seems that this is this is what what it was right he he just was pushing back uh against all these little avenues that the people in power were using to get drugs or human trafficking or oil or any of these sure. things yes and that's what made him made him so dangerous so that's a good example of like the what and i think the like whatever the how would be that his family had access to money that no other real you know politicians mm -hmm. or other people had so it's not like he had to take donations from people and do their bidding because he had his own money he mm -hmm. ran his own he funded his he financed his own campaign uh it's sort of similar to the situation with donald trump and you see the um yeah that's you know actually the powers that be turned uh, against him interesting comparison yeah. right because they're trying to take him and all his money right now not that i think right. he's gonna he's gonna be the guy but it's that same sort yeah. of thing that if you're running for office and if you don't mm -hmm. need to take money from people the fact that right. you even might be dangerous is enough to get you wiped off absolutely i right. think there's levels to blackmailing and i think that the first level is bribery mm -hmm. um like uh you know you just get down you know what i mean yeah. but if you don't get down then you gotta lay down and Actually, that was the that was the next level that kennedy got to yeah, and Kennedy was they like, him no. Down. Yeah, and uh, that. speaking of black males, this reminds me of the Puff Daddy thing, <laughs> right? This yeah, is, yeah. Like, Puff Daddy was obviously doing the Epstein thing for a while for the spooks, right? He was recording. Apparently. Them. Yeah, he was seemed to be recording people banging and all that sort of stuff, making blackmail tapes. Of course, he was tapping Justin Bieber's tight white ass in the meantime, but the idea was to <laughs> use Puffy to get the same sort of Epstein blackmail, but on a different clientele. Puffy's blackmail yes. is going to be the hip hop community, the fashion community, and that sort of thing. But it yes. would be the same thing um, as Epstein. And yes. it seems that something happened, and Puffy, Puffy be on the run. So he doesn't want to get the JFK treatment and have his head just pop open. Mm -hmm. Or the Epstein, he doesn't want to accidentally kill himself. Accidentally hang himself in jail and go back to Israel. It's really interesting, man. It's really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Crypto Esquire says Puff Daddy is actually a command. <laughs> That's disgusting. <laughs> All right, so let's let's start with the with the financial thing, right? Because if Kennedy yeah. wants to fuck up the Federal Reserve, now there's the whole thing of his silver certificates, and and we're not going to get into that. But it seems that historically, any U.S. president who goes against the financial interests or the controlling financial areas ends up having a bad time. Uh, the yes. fir first example, I think, is probably the Indian killer himself is Andrew Jackson, right? Because he had to kick mm. the central bank out of America like twice. I don't think it was just one fight he had. Um, Jackson's whole thing with his campaign was we got to stop the, the central banks. Apparently, back in the day, banks were more local uh, in the United States, and there, there was even mm -hmm. they weren't even close to the fiat idea yet, but the central banks and international bankers are always trying to come in uh, to America and, you know, suck us dry like they've done so well. 
So throughout history, even before JFK, you got so many presidents pissing off the same fucking people. Uh, again, a lot of these presidents either die in office, assassination attempts, and, and all that stuff. So uh, Jackson is the first you know, president that really pisses off these guys. Uh, and then we got McKinley coming along. Now remember, McKinley was on the list of presidents who got cursed by the Tippecanoe curse. Yeah. All right, so there's a weird connection here. Um, so again, McKinley... Uh, is shot twice by an anarchist, Emma Goldman. Now we're not going to get into a racist thing, but that's an interesting last name. Um, so you've got yes. another president here, um, you know, causing some shit, and then we have a possibly uh, Hewish assassin. Again, very strange. We'll get back to that. Um, another president uh, who's on the curse of Tippecanoe list that also pissed off the bankers is James Garfield. Uh, quote from him, whoever controls the volume of money in our country is absolute master of all industry and commerce. When you realize that the entire system is very easily controlled one way or another by a few powerful men at the top, you will not have to be told how periods of inflation and depression originate. Um, so again, spilling the beans gets fucking shot, right? So this is um, another one. <laughs> and then we have this. This is probably the craziest thing. So apparently, uh, Roosevelt was going to fucking lose, right? Uh, this guy, Huey Long, was going to beat Roosevelt. Um, and it yes, would have interesting. Yeah, it would have prevented America possibly from entering into World War II, allying with the Bolsheviks and all that stuff. Um, yeah. But Huey Long was assassinated by Carl Weiss. Yes. Again, maybe an interesting family lineage you could look into there. Um, yes. And, and we all know that Roosevelt served for fucking whatever, how many goddamn terms. Um, and again, yeah. he, Roosevelt was president when they, I believe, when they signed the um, Bretton Woods Accord there. Um, and then we, Yeah, then we get up to JFK. Now, when it comes to JFK, because he was pissing off so many people, it's hard to say who done it. Yes. Um, but we have to mention the fucking Israeli nuclear program, right? Because this is... Uh, very interesting when it comes to Jack Rubenstein and, and this sort of area of some of the players here. Um, so again, you've got Kennedy warning Israel about their nuclear program and wanting to inspect the, the facilities over there and all that stuff. So not only is JFK pissing off the American you know, people, uh, he's pissing off people worldwide. Um, and then you get to um, Jack Ruby, um, doing the uh, the shooting of Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, yeah. this is an interesting thing. I'm just going to read it. Uh, Ruby's defense lawyer also claims in his memoir that Ruby told him, "I did it for the Jews," repeating on several yeah. occasions, "I did this. I did this that they wouldn't implicate Jews." Um, it's hard to yeah, say he, if he was just being paranoid or what, but it's, yeah. it's very interesting quotes. They said he was paranoid, but he he talked at length about how he was trying to prevent another holocaust by doing it i don't know you well, know if, neither here nor there but if, whatever why say, whatever he said that for a fun thought experiment let's say that the final straw that broke the illuminati's back was kennedy trying to take nukes away from israel i don't think that was the final straw right. but let's just say that and then let's say yeah. that was a reason for Mossad to take part in the assassination in some way with the cia just like Mossad. Right helped the CIA do 9-11, right? Mossad helped the CIA kill JFK. Now, if that came out, right, Americans, since they loved Kennedy so much, that might actually be something that would happen, right? So this is why Jack Rubenstein would do it um, for fear because he knew right. Mossad was involved, that he knew that he had to stop that from coming out. Yeah. And, well, and he was given $50,000 or whatever. <laughs> $50,000 does not hurt. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's here's another thing. JFK wanted to make the American Zionist Council, the, the precursor yes. to APAC, yes. um, register as a foreign agent. And yeah. uh, after he does that, he gets a fucking letter from Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, his brother, I think, gets a letter from Donald Rumsfeld. And Rumsfeld is talking to, to Bobby Kennedy. And he's like, you better not fucking do this. <laughs> And we all know yeah. that Rumsfeld was complicit in the whole 9-11 thing. Had to be. Yeah, exactly. Him and the whole fucking crew. So it's the same fucking, same crew even back in Kennedy's day, right? You got Rumsfeld poking his head around. And, and this is way back in the day. What's the date on this letter? 63. So this is a few months before they kill Kennedy that he gets a strongly worded letter about his brother going after APAC. <laughs> So, yeah. fuck, I don't know what to make of that. 
And it doesn't go good for any of the Kennedys, bros, right? No, none of the Kennedy family makes this one. Uh, you know, the no, father it's... dies mysteriously. You got fucking uh, all sorts of dead Kennedys. That's why they named the punk band that, right? This fucking dead Kennedys okay. laying all over the place. Not to mention all the people they had to shut up because they're sloppy jobbing down in Dealey Plaza. And it's... Again, I can see why they locked up the the fucking files, right? Because you would see. You would see not only the the machine parts of the American intelligence apparatus, but the whole global fucking thing would come undone if the Kennedy files were allowed to be, you know, foiled. Um, so then I, and probably now as well. I don't know. The damage probably... I mean, they're obviously just by sealing the records for 75 years, they're trying to, like limit the damage that they know it will cause but i think even now it would just be too much it's like uh if you do your research you're gonna know um you know who general walker is you're gonna know who david ferry is you're gonna know uh who clay shaw is and you're gonna know what happened but it's just there and they just haven't said it you know what i mean yeah yeah and i think they're hoping that whatever world war three will start and then no one will have the time to ask questions about kennedy and 9-11 because we'll yeah. be too busy eating fish, being schmeagle out in the woods. So there's that sort of, if they can hold it off long enough, they won't need to fucking worry about, uh, you know, releasing them because, you know, we'll all be too yeah. fucking busy. Isn't it crazy to think if that's always been the plan, like they've just been putting this off because they knew it would be the end all. And, uh, they, yeah. you know, this has to end before they do that. Yeah, I mean, that's what I always thought about, you know, why would they pop off World War III right now? And I think it's because all of their, their beans have been spilled. Every last bean, the Epstein bean, the Puff yeah. Daddy bean, the fucking Fed the Kennedy, the 9-11, all the, you know, it's like Cat Williams said on that fucking podcast, like, it's all coming out. So, yeah. I think the it's idea, over. yeah, the idea would be to start some fucking World War III type shit, and then we won't have time to worry about the, the vaccine deaths or any of that sort of stuff. Because uh, we'll be in such a weird scenario. Um, so I guess... Gotta do what you gotta do. You gotta do what you gotta do. The poor Illuminati. So much work to manage this planet. Yeah. So, Fudge, let me bring you in here towards the end of the evening. Yeah. Because tonight has been mostly a, a presentation, you know, from Lab Stand to, to the people. But I want to know, when it comes to the language of visual mediums, like moving pictures, the... The idea that you can encode information in layers. What do you think we could do with with such a with such a language of film? Not we, the editorial, not you and me, but just as a as a teaching thing, right? Because it seems that film could be an incredibly useful invention to help people empathize with each other, to inspire people. But it seems to be used for its least pleasant attributes. And I guess what I want to know from Fudge, and then we'll pass it around to Rubs and Evan, is that if, if you could create something like The Shining, what are some of the themes that you would want people to know about in the future? Let's say, you know, a lot of things don't survive in the future, but they find The Shining. How much, you know, could they recreate from it? So what, what are some of the things that... You know, JFK and and money thing. What do you think, Fudge, would be important for future generations of not only Americans, but of, of citizens to know, like, you know, what happened? You know, is there anything that you would think to put in there that, that you don't necessarily immediately see in The Shining or anything else? I mean, I think what Kubrick, like, failed to anticipate, well, maybe he did anticipate this through, like, Clockwork Orange, but like the absolute lack of privacy that will exist in the future where you'll have to work extremely hard to have even a modicum of privacy compared to like what most kids who grew up in a rural area had just in their backyard or on state property, mm. you know, just like romping around the woods. Yeah. That's kind uh, of actually, that makes me think of 2001, right? How Hal is looking at every nook and cranny of the spaceship. Yes, and like I think that's where we're going. There's going to be two classes of people: the people who can control the AI and the people who are subject to it. Mm -hmm. Interesting, man. I would want, you know, something I I don't get from Kubrick movies is 
maybe a little bit in Barry Lyndon is, I guess, the idea back to nature. Maybe that's not the best phrase, but I think maybe Stanley saw our usurpation up into technology is inevitable. But I, my favorite movies are movies that have a strong uh, natural element to it, and they make you pine for the outdoors. They make you yearn to just be outside and to experience what it is like out there. So I think like, uh, go ahead. well, so like an, an essential spiritual question of humanity is whether um, ultimately our highest order is expressed through technological achievement or instead through like the human instinct as experienced as a higher form of animal instinct. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Well, like care to elaborate. in other words, like if everything was made by AI, right? Like no real actors or actresses, just all the movies, all the content, everything is custom tailored made by AI for you. Right. And like, that's what you're consuming. Are you still going to on a spiritual level know that it's bullshit and it's poison or are you going to like lean into it and consume it and become like a neo human and improve from it? Mm. Yeah, I don't know. That's yeah. I, I, I think the Kubrick movies are so bleak, they don't leave me with the vision of the future that I can grab onto. Yeah. Whereas I like a, a Bergman or a Jodorowsky leave me with a little bit of hope uh, for the future, whereas the Kubrick movies for me are super bleak. I mean, people who have a deep level of awareness about the way the world works don't benefit from it most of the time. They just suffer within it, and I think Kubrick did that with his life, mm. and I think we're doing that, and like that's okay. I think ultimately in some ways he was lonely for other intellectuals and like he used the shining to communicate truth safely. Mm. Hiding his power level to the utmost. Something you had to do very carefully at his level. Yeah. I'd imagine it does seem like the more people that listen to you, the more you got to hide, hide that sort of stuff. And the only way to communicate it would be in this fashion. Yes. And with Eyes Wide Shut being kind of like a suicide at the very end when he knew that his, you know, like he had done what he wanted. Yeah, yeah. So he closed in on the fucking point. And that's why that movie is such a like a slap in the face compared to something as nuanced as The Shining and its references. Mm -hmm. Because like at that stage in his life, he was just like, oh, you guys need to know about this bullshit. Yeah, he, he even puts the Rothschild house in the movie for a few seconds, too. So he, he, he's no longer yeah. afraid at that point of hiding the, the level. Yeah, that's a good point. Yes. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I I also go ahead. Well, to like put a pin in the like deeper question of the night of like why do I think the Kennedy assassination happened? I agree with a lot of the finite points that have been discussed. I don't really disagree with anything. Uh but I also think that like ultimately large international organizations that exist above the law like the CIA are like mind viruses. Mhm. Mm uh, with the people in them believing that like their contribution, whether it's like morally good or bad in front of them is like leading to a greater good. And that like the mind virus of the agency is to, to stage coups and then run the country after the coup. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what happened with Kennedy. And I think it's been in the coup state since. Yeah, uh, yeah. And that the president doesn't really like the president isn't supposed to weigh that much in the overall system outlaid by the Constitution. Mm -hmm. But um, when a figure, let's say that Obama was um, anti Illuminati, right? Let's say that Obama was stirring up the shit that Kennedy was. Uh, we all know Obama's a globalist douchebag, right? But imagine that he wasn't. And the love that the people had for him. Um, you know, most people at the beginning when he was hitting, yeah. th when he was hitting three pointers and stuff before he was yeah. killing uh, Gaddafi, right. um, he could have done anything and had the support of the people with him. And, you know, it would have been more difficult for them to do their thing if they had a president who shouldn't have any power, have all that love and stuff of the people. I mean, every king has their knights, right? Mm -hmm. Like every king has the people immediately around them, protecting them and investing in them and negotiating with them and giving them advice. Yeah. And like, if you want to take down the part of the government that's actually running things as the person who should morally do that, but is pinned by their power to not be able to, like you have to lean on all the knights around you to do that. Mm -hmm. And um, it's unlikely you'll win. And your knights probably understand that because they're there with you. And they're going to get and... killed too, like Bobby. Bobby was a knight for Jack, and Bobby didn't make it either. 
precisely. And so in in that perspective, you could see why, like, if Obama was ever not nefarious, um, it made a lot of sense to him to lean towards what the agency wanted and what was already going on in terms of the military industrial complex and the agenda. Mm -hmm. Like, I think leaders are all ultimately creatures of their own habits that got them there. Yeah, it's 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 one of the reasons I'm glad we're not popular. <laughs> you know, if we yeah. had if we had more subscribers, we wouldn't I would have that thing in the back of my head where okay, my ramblings are reaching 100,000 people instead of 100. So there would be that extra weight and I couldn't say and do some of the things I do necessarily maybe without thinking to myself later. Ooh, that was probably a bad idea. It's not like I have yeah. the reach of a Kanye West or something where anything he says is going to get amplified so much. And and to have that sort of power over the mass mind, I think it's like a double-edged edged sword, right, with their mass communication media thing is that all it takes is a rogue agent like Puff Daddy or Kanye who's developed their following once they get them unbrainwashed you know kanye is an example right whenever kanye goes off his meds he starts showing up on alex jones and shit and it's people that are in the big club have to be kept in the big club and i think p diddy and epstein and these parties are they go a long way to keep people in the club by blackmailing the shit out of them um, and it makes me wonder if they weren't doing some blackmail tapes with kennedy and monroe back in the day I mean, I think so. I also think that like the Mossad and the way the Five Eyes are organized is changing in front of us um, in myriad ways. I, you know, like when when you guys talk about that stuff, honestly, I don't disagree with a lot of what's been discussed. But I also wonder about like an example, the female doctor who gave Jack Ruby the shot that gave him cancer super fast and then she died in the particle collider. Mm. Um, like she wasn't Jewish um, and you find a lot of people within the agency who are collaborative as fuck with Mossad and collaborative as fuck with like the Israeli cause, not just Jewish cause, the Israeli cause. Yeah. And um, I often wonder because um, I don't think they were compelled by the Jewish plight. I don't think they were. As for like Mossad's behavior, I mean, like, here's what I'll say from my perspective on that. Like, imagine going through the Holocaust and then going through the Six Day War and like the fever pitch paranoia that some of the people in that country were facing at that point, um, you'd want nukes and like <laughs> you do fucking anything for those nukes. And like, guess what? They have them like, and it happened around this time. And Kennedy certainly wasn't approving of that. And um, it's a sad, tragic twist of human fate to me. I, like as a, as a semi, like, <laughs> I don't think Jews are going to run things in the next hundred years. I hope well, we're no. around. Again, bro. like uh... my, my expectation is minimized and I'm not saying you're hating. I'm absolutely not. I think there's culpability there. I also think the mob played a role. I think like the, the agency played a primary role. I think the Cubans play like played a role. I think he, he targeted the wrong people just like oh, that. Absolutely. Meme showed. Yeah, absolutely. And like, that's the real effect of what happens. But ever since that happened with LBJ coming into power next, there's never been a legitimate government, I don't think. No, doubtful. Doubtful that we'll ever have. Well, the, you know, if, like yeah. the water's poisoned. Like we would have to start again. And none of the characters on the stage are characters I want to start again with. <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting that before we jump over to Evan real quick, it's interesting that we, we've come to this this scenario of nations and each nation has its little intelligence agency group made up of psychopaths that the, the nation or the state will use in, in any way that they want to to accomplish their goals. Whether you're talking the CIA being used by the United States or Mossad being used by Israel or the KGB being used by Russia, every nation has this group of motherfuckers to do the dirty work, right? Denzel and his boys in the fucking Desert Storm or whatever. There's... It's set up that they, they can do it this way, and it's just, you don't realize well, it till after, right? The, the Israeli art students in the Twin Towers before 9-11 were just Israeli art students. Only after do we realize they're Mossad. Like, furthermore, sir, between you, I, and everyone listening, you know, and Evan, and Rubs, <laughs> right? Like, laws don't exist. No. They don't actually yeah. exist. There's, like, I believe there's biblical law, and there's like a real right and a wrong, but like if you take the approach to life that like you love the people you love and laws are secondary and don't exist and mean nothing, mm -hmm. 
Like if you take that stance, whatever your race is, whatever your gender is, like you're going to go fucking in for those causes. Yeah, totally, totally. Good point. Good it's, point. It must be it must be nice to be a psychopath and not burdened with the morality <laughs> that everyone else has, right? Like and e like every creed has psychopaths. Yeah, it's yeah. just how you use them. I would argue like honestly. Like I had a buddy in in high school, I had a buddy that would swerve at squirrels and stuff. You know, he was a psycho. He joined the Navy. He, oh, was, yeah. he was completely nuts. And and I would be like the kind of person to be like, dude, what the fuck is wrong with you? But he had a fucking, <laughs> he had a rough childhood and shit, you know, single mother. He, he didn't have dad around. And there were things that happened in his life to make him a psychopath and, you know, kidnap pigeons and let him loose in the apartment and all sorts of insane shit, you know, like... <laughs> And if yes. you can build an apparatus that filters out your civilians to get these people into your organization, well, then that's all the better for your organization because you can operate in any way that you see fit because it's full of maniacs. Yes. Yeah, I wouldn't want honest... Like, again, yeah. a mind virus that they've all been infected with and they can't, like, they can't... Uh confront the mind virus they've been infected with without being culpable for all the actions they've done in between. Mm. And that's why... It's like, oh, if you fucking tell a secret, you got to die because the mentality is part of the trip that is joining that group of people. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't ever want to work in Washington because it seems like even being on the outskirts, you could get roped into some fucking absurd shenanigans uh, just because of the way it is. You know, all these spy novels that you read where it's just some regular girl graduates and gets a job and she's wrapped up in Saddam Hussein's chemical weapons program or some shit before she even knows it. Now, Evan, I want to bring you in here. Evan, as a asp oh, yeah. aspiring creative type yourself, what are some of the themes and stuff that you would want to shove uh, into your ear-shining movie? Like, I know you're into mm. some of the, the Christian themes of The Lighthouse, and do you think yeah. it's important to, if you're going to be making a film in this fashion, to not just give us information about the conspiracy, yeah. but to what, what sort of things would you put in there to sort of lift up your, your audience? So, yeah, I, like I, I write screenplays and things like that. And one thing that I, I think is uh, important is to have a good message uh, when you are sort of communicating people, communicating with people um, on a deeper level uh, where they, it's sort of secret and uh, it's it's not easily explainable. It's extremely stressful for your audience to really uh, like articulate Hmm. Um, all this information that you're putting into these films and like of course you know I ran around like with a, a chicken with its head cut off talking about like I see this Zapruder film in The Shining and it just so happened that I found this group of people where uh, I could actually talk about it and uh, <laughs> before that time it was extremely difficult so the one thing that I try to put into my screenplays is uh, it's nice um, that if you get the secrets, it's happy. And uh, that's very important to me that uh, the audience, like um, there are directors who hate people. There are, you know, there are a lot of people that dislike just general audience, just or what you would call normies or just people. And uh, so they fuck with them. That would, that's not me. I'm not the type of person that wants to hurt people or fuck with them mm. uh, because I hate them. I'm more like a, I'm, I'm trying to help or uh, in some way, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's not that this is a perfect example, but it's making me think of the movie, the menu with Ray Fiennes and Anna Taylor joy. And if you haven't seen the menu, it's this chef that's really rich and famous and yeah. he's got everything a, a, an aspiring chef could ever, ever want. But he finds himself in this place where the chef's work is so exclusive and so good that He's only catering to the upper crust of society, and it fucking drives him insane, and he just wants to cook mm. for someone that's hungry. You know, he just wants to cook right. a meal for a hungry exactly. person. And he wants exactly. to, to have that simple joy of just feeding a hungry person and making them smile and taste amazing things. But he's driven, mm. he's in the movie, he's driven to a fucking murderous um, escapade right. by the fact that he's become so successful and isolated by his success. It's interesting. Um, I think movie. that there there are levels to um, things that are put into movies, and if you are 
I don't know if it's your archetype or your phenotype or whatever it is. Maybe it's your lived experience or it's just your genetic makeup that uh, I somehow found, you know, God in the movie, the lighthouse while other people that might just be into um, um, Greek um, myth might see something totally different in the movie. Or let's say you watch the Northman and you love the pagan themes and, uh, but underneath way, way, way underneath the film is Christian theology. That's and a, so if you, you hide say, it in a, layers, that's a funny one for me. Yeah. In layers, especially yeah. with the Northmen or with the Northmen, because yeah. you have that line wow. in there where you're like, their God is a, is a corpse on a cross. We're going to mop the floor with these yes. guys. <laughs> exactly. So he overtly, you know, they burn an entire village of Christians inside a building. I mean, when you watch it the first time, I'm sure Christians, they'll be revolted at this uh, persecution that they feel, but it's not necessarily the secrets hidden in the movie. It's how the movie makes you feel. I think Fellini would always talk about how it doesn't matter uh, the secrets that you put in the movie. It's the feeling that the movie gives you. So yeah. it actually does. It does the thing without doing the research is that Christians will watch the movie and feel persecuted and therefore, um, you know, have the correct feeling that they want. Um, and uh, pagans that watch the movie, they'll feel, um, you know, they'll uh, feel confirmed in a, in a mm. way. And uh, so they also feel the, the feeling that they want to feel from the movie. And he accomplishes his goal without even having to do the research. Mm, it's and... almost like hate watching. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> and it's this is interesting to me, too, because... It is about that feeling. How do you feel if you yes. if you sit down and watch a movie? You know, if you have yeah. some time, and what do you feel like when you when you're done watching that movie? And yeah, most Kubrick movies leave you feeling not so great. And to right. to, to realize you have this power as a, as someone who creates the a film or a video or a mashup or whatever, and you can. Not this is isn't, isn't derogatory to you guys in any way and any of my viewers, but you can sort of imagine the people on the other end as little emotion organs and what cor mm -hmm. what chords are you going to play on these people are you going to play only dissonant negative chords with your film or right. are you going to play throw some major stuff in there and you know make it a a, a more complete experience um even right yeah i think part of kubrick's coldness is that so you will lock on to all the subliminal quote unquote stuff Sure. Um, and that's just Kubrick's style, whereas, uh, uh, let's take Tarkovsky, I guess, his is a, a little warmer feeling, and, and even though they're depressing and sure. despondent, they you come away with a slightly different flavor, I think, uh, from something like that. And that's one of the beautiful things about uh, this incredibly dangerous tool that us monkeys have invented. Right. Now, Rubs, you're a filmmaker, aspiring. Um, what When it yeah. comes to making films, do you do you think like, like this at all about um information you want to encode or are you you more interested in like story and characters and you know sets and what what is it for you um when it comes to either making film or thinking about making film what's going to be important for you for stuff to to cram in there uh well i don't know how to make a movie but what i would want is to be honest is to be honest um, and to achieve pure cinema, cinema, which is barely any dialogue, what, like the old silent films, mm -hmm. pure cinema, where it can only be achieved through visual, the visual language, but you can just feel it. It's what's, um, don't go into the verbal straight jacket as Stanley Kubrick called it, the, um, verbal straight jacket that traps so many people, mm -hmm. especially now, um, try to aim for the effect, which is one of the main um, points of room 2001 um the effect not the meaning yeah um right um i and, and, and i would want to create something of value where we're basically um to try and get the viewer to stop watching movies right to sort to um watch say watch watch my not like say if they watch <laughs> my movie right they would they don't want to watch any other movie mm. right because it has so much value Right, that all the other movies, right, all the sort of junk that gets released now, yeah, yeah, we'll That's finally see interesting. that um they have no, it has no value, right? Because I mean, it's the same with book. It's 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 like that's why people consume 
well that was that was one of the main purposes why art art existing exists in culture is to have value mm. or to add value um and to make sense of the world right but cinema um has lost has lost lost its touch well it's, it's I, I would say like uh, like we're sort of entering like the dying the dying stage of um movies like the yeah. only the only good movies that are out now well robert eggers is the only filmmaker right now um that actually has something to say nice. and, and, and that's actually um valuable right mainly also because he, he replicates old he doesn't go for any modern modern styles he, he only yeah. tries to replicate old film styles um um right um yeah it's true even with even with his aspect ratios like he'll film in a four by three and he won't even do a widescreen movie or anything although that's that's intentional that's that that it's not just like a you know like a stylish 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 fuck stylish you get it out there rubs yeah Yeah. well here's here's something i want to bring up to you rubs is you say that you want to you want to eventually shoot on film right that's you don't want to do anything digital yeah Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, are you aware of a, a camera called a Bolex? No. All right. So, right now, before the hipsters ruin it, you're gonna want to look into like 16 millimeter film. Hipsters are gonna ruin yeah, this I, thing. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I've got. I, I actually brought a 16 millimeter camera like a few, uh, two years ago, yep. right, to use it. But I, I didn't realize that. Um, because uh, I, I was pl- planning on getting like film stock from yep. like a camera shop. Yeah. Right, except I didn't. I didn't realize they didn't sell it. They didn't sell the film stock, right? And and so in order for me to actually get film stock online, right, and they cost like each film stock, like uh, uh, like cost at least like sixty dollars or something, like motion picture. Well, yeah, but um, I think a roll of Kodak sixteen millimeter probably run you about fifty dollars American. I don't know what it would cost to get it yeah, shipped, no, it's shipped it's down ridiculous. to Australia. Uh, yeah, it's rid- it's ridiculous. So I, I just I just scrap the whole day and now yeah. i've got like this sort of prop of a 16 millimeter camera but um it's, it's completely I think useless it would, be, it would be an interesting way for you to to practice um you know what i mean because i i try to shoot regular just still photography with an old camera and there's a little bit of math involved in real film yeah. photography and i'm terrible at math i just got a roll of pictures back and it was fucking terrible um so yeah i thought well, actually... yeah. <laughs> you, you got to measure you got well, one, one of the most important things I, I know you gotta like measure measure the light yeah, yeah the light right i know people have like apps on their phones that they use to like measure the lights right to make it just easier mm. right but um but i get i guess it you is should worth check it, it out rubs it, hey rubs you know if you got a job it actually wouldn't be a big deal to order <laughs> a few rolls of uh 50 dollars 16 millimeter film yes but yes but then um, you'd have to get a job <laughs> yeah exactly uh, uh i was gonna say what was i gonna say um uh you're gonna say we're winding it down rub so you know this was true. this was the first bone club in about half a year it's been about six months since we did one of these bad boys um so you know it wasn't maybe perfect but i hope uh that we showed you guys a few things about the shining that you didn't know before maybe made you think a thing or two that you didn't think before now, uh, the plan for the live show, I think, since we're still on the cusp of World War III, we're going to continue to do the last Sunday of the month will be the Bone Club, and the Sunday before the last month, or before, wait, I, the Sunday before the last is going to be uh, Lab Stand Live, where we do the uh, the current events and stuff and just fuck around. Um, now, as far as next month's Bone Club... Uh, Rubs, are there any movies or Kubrick themes that you would like to see uh, on next month's episode of the Bone Club? Uh, um, I don't. Well, uh, yeah, uh, I could, nothing comes to mind. Okay, okay. Because I, I was thinking we do a we do a two thousand one not a watch party, but I'll I'll get a bunch of frames from two thousand one. We'll just sort of watch it. And that movie came out in April nineteen sixty eight. And it will be April next month. So I was thinking 2001. Uh, Evan, any sort of areas that you uh, think might be interesting for next month's uh, Bone Club? Um, so I think uh, maybe this season we could do this. Uh, I've been thinking about it. So I me- remember I had come on the live show and I told you about the uh, the Captain William Morgan thing yeah. uh, hidden in Scooby-Doo. Okay, so... That book that Captain William, that was the cause of him being assassinated, uh, the Freemason expose book, 
Oh, well, man. if you that that gives you every single ceremony, every single hand sign, everything. If you, if we collectively were to read that as a group and then watch Barry Lyndon, I'm sure we could come up with a ton of shit. Oh, interesting. All right, maybe we do a Lyndon thing too. That's good. All right, I'll write Lyndon down. That right could here. be that could be another month because that that's going to be you know for us to I don't know exactly how long that thing is, but uh, it would probably take us a month or two for to read it. Yeah, I'm thinking like we pick okay. we, we pick a theme or a Kubrick movie for for each month. Like this month it was The Shining. Next month it'll be that. And the next yeah. month of Barry Lyndon. So Fudge, what do you think? Uh, areas of this thing to explore this uh, year go ahead uh, rubs well actually we, we we were supposed to do barry linden like like almost know, two years yeah, ago I know, rubs look at us way behind schedule yes all right so we'll put it on right. the list i got a list right here I'm, I'm literally writing this down right now all right so fudge what you think um we've done private joker full metal jacket we did some eyes wide shut we did some being there uh what else do you think we could serve the people up this year so like just because it's like my jelly roll lately and I'm interested in it, I want to like look at Sumerian symbolism. Okay. Um, but I would expand that out to just be like an episode on all of the kooky symbolism in all the films that is direct like iconography. Okay, so you know like, an I mean? old, like like not an subtle, school. like actual, like this is a sign of this god or this is a sign of. This group of people who have sexual proclivities. Okay, like sort of like the Ishtar star and eyes wide shut, and sort of the the older yeah. the older symbols, a deeper geological layer of this thing. Yeah, like okay. just just because like it's a it's a surface thing that I think when added up could imply deeper things. Yeah, totally. I know there's a, a few uh, things about uh, Ishtar and Anana and the Shining and stuff, so that's something we can look into. Cool. So yes. all right, really old shit down right here boom all right cool um i think we could do uh maybe an episode about kubrick's personal life too right you know how we talked about look magazine and, and that sort of stuff but i was thinking you know well, who was his first wife did he have a, a son before you know how do you meet his other wife what's up with vivian oh, yeah, Go ahead, yeah J uh, J james um uh about a year ago had got acquired this book this book from his from his from Stanley's first wife, because Stanley's first wife was a ballerina, mm -hmm. or maybe that was his second wife, um, ballerina, right? But I think his no, his first wife died in a car crash, um, uh, right, like a few years after, no shit. like in the fifties. I, th really? I think, I think, um, um, I was gonna say, fuck. I mean, yeah, it, interesting. I, no, I we can uh, yeah. we can look into that sort of thing, like a little Kubrick bio episode. You know, yeah. I think that oh, would be fun. Well, well, here's a here's a here's a Kubrick quote for you. Um, if you want to make if you want to make God laugh, uh, tell him your plans. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. That's classic. That's a rephrasing of the whatever, uh, the the plans of mouse and men, mice and men or whatever that old ass quote. Um, oh, I don't know. It was a reference. Well, he probably knew that as a filmmaker too. You can plan a million things, but then she. Well, oh, actually, <laughs> go ahead. Actually, here's an interest. Okay, here's an interesting, interesting thing. Since you mentioned Stanley's, per, uh, that we might talk about um, the personal life of Kubrick. Um, I one of his earliest, one of like I think in one inter, in one one of the earliest inter, interviews he gave, he mentioned that um, he didn't because. Obviously, he didn't know he didn't know what he was going to do when uh, when he came out of high, when he um uh well, when he left high school, um right. And one of the things he mentioned was that he 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 was thinking about becoming like a um like a novelist, um right, like a great novelist, mm. um right. Yeah, I mean, I could see that. Uh, I could see. I could see that yeah. he would want to write, but I think once you get if you're wanting, trying to convey ideas and stuff and you realize the potential of film, why the fuck would you bother with the old? That's like listening to a tape when you got a fucking high def. Oh, wait, wait, one more, one more thing. This, this, this is like, um, um, to suggest that that Stanley Kubrick, well, sort of like what Jason Horsley, um, sort of says, uh, is that Stanley Kubrick had a rare type of intelligence, um, Right, I'm not talking. I'm not talking about the myth of like the 200 IQ yeah. bullshit thing, um, um, but um, but like the um, like uh, one of um, Stanley's frequent collaborators, um, Joe Joe Turkill Turkill, you know, you know yeah. the guy in The Shining, yeah, like Lloyd the, with the Lloyd, Lloyd the bartender. Yeah. He 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 gave a lecture. He gave a lecture in 2001 after Stanley died um, 
about his experience with Stanley. And Stanley told um, uh, Joel this, um, um, that he said um, that he was so good at chess. Um, apparently, he didn't say this in a bra- in a break in a bragger dose. He didn't say this in a in, in a bragging way. Um, he said that he, he he was so good at chess that he could have been world class. He was he he was on he would have been on the same level as Bobby Fischer. <laughs> um, right, but he said he just liked movies too much. Yeah. Um, right, and also well, chess chess is also the essential part of um the Kubrickon or Kubrick. Um, right. So what yeah, what well, I'm, I'm one of one of um, another Stan, another one of Stanley's um friends said that Stanley always viewed life as chess, mm. right? Yeah, yeah. That's I mean that was a classic uh competition game back in the day, right? You say Bobby Fischer and all these classic names, and they're teaching the AI computers to do chess, and maybe it is a useful sort of uh a thing we could do is go and look through all the chess things because if it is how you know, Kubrick saw the world and people. It's probably how he approached the making of his movies. Well, yeah, you know, well, like... well, that, that's that's how he knew how to manipulate manipulate people very yeah. well. He was excellent um, at it, right? Like actually, um, um, one like I, I think yeah, uh, I heard this well, from cause... the Jason Hawes. Go book, ahead, Rubs. Um, but but yeah, one like in in the set of two thousand one. I don't think it's really common knowledge, but people were having mental breakdowns. Um, mainly the production um, um, des- um, staff uh, or the production designer staff, um, right? Like, because Stan- Stanley always viewed the art department or the production people as like just lazy, uh, who would always <laughs> just talk, you know, always just waste time, right? So he would always be um, giving them multiple tasks at-, at once, right? And constantly people were having mental breakdowns, um, right? A- um, a- anyways, but um, apparently, like just one stare, like Kubrick didn't have to say anything. Just one look, one look at at, at somebody, right? And it, it and, and that person, and that and it would and he would say everything with his with his eyes. Yeah, he wouldn't that's... have to say anything, and the person would just be under control, um, and just get to work instantly. <laughs> it's like right? it's just like the menu. The the chef has so much power over these little sous chefs and these prep cooks. They just worship him. And anything well, you know, the and, chef yeah, well, will do in this movie, the the crew goes, "Yes, chef, we love you, is, chef." Which is how, which is how Stanley sort of betrayed himself as well on purpose, because like, well, like Malcolm McDowell, Malcolm McDowell said on the set of Clockwork Orange that people were treating him like he was goddamn god, god, right? Like, um, yeah, um, right. Well, that's uh, the, he the, the celebrity sort of... worship, Rubs. You know the whole thing, and fucking people, they they. They think he's this fucking amazing figure. They get to work with him. They're so lucky. Of course, they're not gonna fucking. Yeah, they're but, not gonna fuck up their yeah. one chance to work with the but, quote unquote greatest director. But like, but like Jason Hawes, he sort of um, mentions. But like I said, I'm, I'm sort of ignorant because I haven't read his his full Kubrickon book. But um, Kubrick purposely, um, well, Tevely's yeah. Um, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that Kubrick purposely betrayed himself as um, um, or ha- had that sort of mystery. Right on purpose. Oh yeah, right, totally. Because to you, you can get more done that way. If people worship you, you're gonna yeah. have an easier time of getting your your plans done. Whereas if people are questioning you and all that thing at every stage, so I guess I could see why yeah. we create that myth. All right, so it's the end of the night, Rubs. We're not gonna have time for the uh, the third uh, trivia question. So you are off the hook. Uh, so, ladies right. and gentlemen, I am posting the third prize in the YouTube chat right now because we are not allowed to play this next video. Uh, on YouTube, but that is a download link to the first ever Laboratorium Stanley mashup from, oh my God, 2016. Uh, that is, uh, you, yeah, you can download it right there in the YouTube chat. That is two minutes fear right there, baby. And we're not allowed to play that on YouTube because it has a clip of what? John Podesta going, you think you're hot shit, don't you? Uh, and that shit is just what? totally banned. <laughs> Wait, uh, Lab Stan, when when was the first like mashup mashup you this did? Is like it. when when this when... is it? I just posted oh, okay. it. Okay, two thousand fifteen. Was that also... December two thousand fifteen? Okay. Was that also when you created the? Ch- was the that birth. also when you yep. created the channel? That was okay. the birth of Lab Stan. But then I only posted the birth like, of the nation. Yeah, I posted like, three videos in the first like few years. But yeah, it all started with that video. And again. Uh, I can't play it on YouTube because it's got 9-11 towers collapsing. It's got Kennedy's head exploding. But I consider this uh, mashup my finest work. Everything else is derivative um, of this mashup. Again, 
you can download that. And if you don't believe me that it's banned, I dare you try to post it to YouTube. Uh, feel free, and we'll see how long it lasts. But the last time I checked, uh, it definitely got a strike on the old YouTube no, this, for graphic this content. Web, the, this website, YouTube, has has just gone on a down on a downhill. Like 2015 <laughs> wasn't worst. even that long ago. And you can like on YouTube, you could do um uh, like on 2015, there was so, there was way more yeah. variety, um right even just in graphic content, you could post way more shit. Yeah, this this was... video was banned about two years after it was first posted. But yeah, if you try to post it now, it'll totally get jacked up. Uh, but that's a link right there. That way you can download it and you can just you know every once in a while take it out of your pocket and be like, man, Lab Stan when he was young was a badass. He's old as fuck now, but when he was young, he was badass. Um, yeah, YouTube sucks, Rubs, but it's the easiest uh, platform for me to uh, shit post, and I think we get pretty get away with a, a fair amount uh, amazing stuff we get away with around here because we only have 500 subscribers. It's fucking what? great. Go ahead, Rubs. Have you thought last about you... thing, have I thought about what? Okay. Have you thought about using like the you know like um, Rumble, like the nope. political? Nope. Uh, okay. Because, what about because, Substack? No, because I don't care about growing my audience. Yeah, that's true. I just want to have fun, so I don't look for other platforms. I just want to have fun, yeah, baby. Not, yeah, I don't look for platforms that'll, whatever, allow me to do things that I feel I can't do. Again, that video's banned because it had Kennedy's head and 9-11, and it's just like, I could try it again, but you guys give it a shot. Try to post it on your YouTube channels. Um, and and, and one, one more thing is... Wait, one more thing. This is to um the Frank Zappa, the Frank Zappa fan yep. who's in the audience. Yep. All I got to say is California <laughs> hardcore ecstasy. Holy shit, Rubs. Not bad. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> that was Ruben. Don't call me a fucking bogan. Mr. Rubs, thank you for coming to the show this oh, morning. Oh, you still remember? You still remember? Dude, I've been, calling, I've been calling some of the kids at work bogans now. It's fucking part of my lexicon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rubs, thank you for coming by this morning. I hope you have a productive day down there in Australia. Uh, feel free to you come too. back again. We got, two, uh, we got the current events show that you hate. And then I'll keep you guys posted what we decide to do for a show next month. Uh, you know, it wasn't a 10 out of 10 episode, but it was pretty damn good. Uh, so, Evan, if you want to pop in here, say anything at the end of the night. Again, thanks for coming by after your long fucking week, man. I appreciate it. Uh, we did not get to go skiing this yeah. winter, but you didn't miss anything, man. The snow was fucking sh <laughs> shit this year. Um, but we'll, we'll go skiing next winter, man. We'll fucking hook up. But anything you want to say to the yeah. people at the end of the night? Um, I got, like, uh, whatever. I had some shit happen this past week, so I've kind of behind but uh i i really really want to have this lighthouse video out in the next month or so i'm really oh, really yeah. close i'm Hell 90 yeah. Percent done yeah and if you do it's it we'll, really good we'll, shit, uh, guys. we'll do it live on the uh, current events show we'll just do a whole section where we play it live on the show and shit all right guys i'm gonna try so fucking hard to have this thing ready before the second to last sunday yeah, of let me next just, month let me check yeah it's like i said if not we'll do it in may uh, the live show for yeah 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 april 21st is the current events show and then the 28th will be the bone club so yeah keep me posted on that I, you know uh, i've i've been white i've been waiting ever since no. you ever since you um sort of um um sort of talked about your um analyses yeah. of the lighthouse i've been waiting for almost a year for you to make it <laughs> rubs. Well, I'm, I'm, rubs. I'm still i'm still waiting for the width for the um decoding the witch, yeah, the witch part, part too, too. See, this, this is, is going like... to expose most of that shit. Uh, you'll, you'll just, you should be able to just watch The Witch by yourself and get all the shit after watching this, this lighthouse video. I promise you, it's going to be worth. I know it's been six fucking months. I have put my yeah. shining, my retard schizo fucked up brain <laughs> into this for six months. I promise. It's going to be worth the wait. Awesome. Please stick with uh, me, buddy. And again, this is, okay. uh, if you guys don't know, that's Evan RF24 over on YouTube. We'll post his uh, his channel down in the bottom once this thing goes live. And uh, he's got some really fucking cool videos about the witch and all sorts of shit. I would say my favorite one is the um, the one that's got like 15,000 views or whatever. That witch video that blew yeah, up. Yeah, the witch. That yeah. one is fucking mint. I this is the this is the witch on this on steroids. This is everything, dude. I have every goddamn everything. Every single piece of the set, every single line of dialogue has a secret. I fucking have it all. I can't nice. wait to show you guys this video. Nice, dude. And it's good that we can fucking shout out a director from New Hampshire, Massachusetts, like us, right? Some fucking 
Some He's fucking, the fucking man. Yeah, some fucking Flatlander from Massachusetts. I love it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, look forward to that. Um, everybody, thank you for stopping by. We're going to get Fudge on here at the end of the night as well. See if there's Hello? anything. Hey, Fudge, anything you want to fucking leave us with here at the end of the night? Any suggestions for uh, what we do next as far as the Bone Club? Um, I just uh, two more weeks, you know, two more weeks. That's right. You want to do two the Sumerian weeks, stuff. Baby. I got it right here. Really old shit fudge. Right. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, all really right. Old so yeah. Shit. Uh, so yeah, uh, as we approach, uh, the, uh, world war three, stay tuned fudge. Mm-hmm, we're going to mm-hmm. be doing those current events shows that we love to do so much. Um, and like I said, next month on Sunday, we'll do a fucking bone club at the end of the month, space odyssey or something else. I'll keep you posted. Uh, thank you chat okay, for stopping month. by. Uh, well, mm-hmm. it's already April for you, Rubs. It's already the first of April, so you know yeah, what I mean. Yeah. At the end of your month. What? Mm. Well, I got on the on the exact on the exact end end of the, uh, um end of the month, like April thirty first. No. Or uh, no, the uh, last Sunday. This is a Sunday show. Twenty eighth of April yes. is the Bone Club, buddy. Okay. Nice, nice, cool. Uh, so thank yes, you sir. to Crypto. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, thank you to Zappa and Crypto. Who else is in here tonight? Um, we got American in Russia. We got all sorts of people. So thank you guys. I hope it wasn't too boring. I hope you laughed a little bit. I hope you cried a little bit. Uh, and we're going to do it again next month. Uh, who was it? Crypto. Were you the one telling me to check out, uh, Mastermind's commentary on room 237? Anyway, if that was you, uh, the library found me a copy and it's, I'm picking it up tomorrow. Uh, so I'm going to check out the commentary tracks on room 237. Uh, and maybe if the Mastermind commentary track is really exciting, uh, we'll just do a whole Bone Club show about it. I can't really find it on the internet. It's kind of tough. Only bits and pieces. Uh, so, uh, wait. yeah. I do. I do have to admit. Um, during this episode, I did. I did sort of. I still. Uh, um, I, obviously, I didn't. I didn't leave the sh- the show. But um, I, I, while you were talking, I was. Jer- I, jer- I was jerking off. Um, before because I, I was like, that's a, that's I a good way to get banned. I didn't have. Yeah, I didn't have time to um, um, like fucking jerk disgusting, off this morning. dude. Yeah. But, All right, Rubs. Well, you're but, officially banned yeah. from the show, and you're also pretty gay for jerking off to a dude's voice. But you know, you do you, man. No, 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 no. Like it wasn't. No, it wasn't. T- no, it wasn't. Anyway. All right, <clears throat> that's fine. In that case, you're not banned. So, Fudge, uh, leave it to Rubs to end the show on a completely disgusting note. But that's just how the young like, teenage uh, boys I take be doing back what it. I, I take back what I said. You it was can't. A bit unnecessary, you can't actually. take it back, Rubs. This is going out on the internet. Left-handed kangaroo over here. Fucking disgusting yes. wombat. <laughs> All right. Hey, thank you guys a lot. Um, I know it's not the most professional show on YouTube, but hey, it's a lot of fun. Uh, so you guys, until next time, uh, enjoy the eclipse next week. I think I'm going to... um fly my drone around during the eclipse so i might do like a little vi- yeah i'll do like a drone eclipse video with some ambient music and maybe post it since some of you guys um aren't going to be near the eclipse um if aliens come out i'll try to get them on the camera and uh, we'll go from there uh so thank you evan thank you fudge thank you rubs and everybody else for joining me on this adventure through film and cinema and mild schizophrenia uh we'll see you in a few weeks <laughs>